morning. The committee will come to order. The Oversight Committee exists to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know what they get from the money Washington takes from them and that it is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers, because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the U.S. government bureaucracy. Today we have a distinguished panel, and today we will hear from five commissioners in what I believe will be an extraordinary hearing, one in which an independent commission that Americans rely on to ensure that we have safe and reliable nuclear power, and particularly safe nuclear power. It has become a concern to this committee that, in fact, the Commission is not operating in a way that can continue. I will not prejudge anyone's motives. I will not prejudge here today anyone's testimony. But I am deeply concerned that a Commission is not, in fact, an autocratic agency. It is not, in fact, the office of any one person. For a Commission to work successfully, or any agency that has a board, whether it is the National Transportation Safety Board or a host of others that we rely on for safety particularly, it has to lead by consensus. Doing the basic arithmetic, this is a three Democrat, two Republican Commission. If it were three and two the other way or any combination, it should work and work by consensus. The history of this agency, of this Commission, has been generally to work by consensus or near consensus. The Committee will examine today whether, in fact, under current Commissioners and current structure, this Commission can get back to working on a, on a consensus-like basis. Ultimately, all five of you are charged with the same level of responsibility and the same obligation to sound science and sound safety. On a personal note, I have two active reactors in my district. Like anyone who has nuclear power in their district, every day we ask, is it safe? And we are answered, yes. And every day we ask, could it be safer and more reliable? We want that answer always to be increasingly yes. So as we hear from members on the dais, and then hear from our witnesses. I think you will hear that all of us have the same concern. One of the ranking members, Mr. Kucinich, has been actively involved in his nuclear power plant for many years. But whether you have nuclear power in your district or not, we all understand that if all our nuclear power plants went down in America, the lights would go out. There is not sufficient replacement power today or in the foreseeable future to live without the highly reliable base load that comes from nuclear energy. So as we hear from all of you, I intend to allow each of you to do, deliver your full opening statements and a reasonable amount of additional remarks if they are beyond what your opening statement is. I then intend to be very, 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 very willing to hear you give a complete answer to any question. That is not to say that members on the dais can go to five, or 4 minutes and 59 seconds and then somehow find a question. But I want to hear from each of you. This is not one in which anyone on the dais here today, to the best of my knowledge, has the capability of taking the seats you occupy. We have to rely on what we learn here today to know whether or not this Commission can operate at the level 
that is essential if we are going to have safe nuclear power in this country. And with that, I recognize the ranking member for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. In uh, March of this year, a massive uh, earthquake and subsequent tsunami killed more than 20,000 people and devastated northern Japan. It caused catastrophic damage at four of the nuclear reactors at the Fukushima power station. This was the worst nuclear disaster since Chernobyl 25 years earlier. Our number one priority on this committee must be ensuring that we learn the lessons of the Fukushima disaster and take appropriate action to improve the safety of nuclear power plants in this country. Yesterday, the Union of Concerned Scientists issued a statement imploring our committee to focus today's hearing squarely on these safety issues. Dr. Lesbeth Grunland, a physicist and co-director of Global Security Program at USC, UCS, urged the committee to focus on the safety issues facing U.S. reactor fleet rather than on our, our <coughs> NRC's internal squabbling. And let me say this on behalf of the American people. I ask that, and you to you, Chairman Jocko, and to the other commissioners, I ask that you not allow your disagreements to become the enemy of the destiny of this great organization. I also ask that you not allow your squabbling to have the effect of being a weapon of mass distraction. That is so important. I strongly agree with the statements of Ms. Lundgren. The single most critical issue facing the NRC today is how it will respond to the Fukushima crisis. Five months ago, a task force of Korea and RC staff issued 12 recommendations intended to make U.S. nuclear power plants safer. In October, the staff prioritized eight of these recommendations. According to the staff, these recommendations have the greatest potential for safety improvement in the near term and should be started without delay. For example, one of the key problems in the Fukushima disaster was that the tsunami knocked out the station's backup power, causing temperatures to rise in four reactors and resulting in the substantial release of radiation. NRC staff has recommended that all existing and new reactors in the United States strengthen their capabilities to mitigate these types of blackouts. I look forward to hearing the views of all the commissioners today on how we can implement this and other reforms as soon as possible. With respect to the allegations of mismanagement, let me say this. I agree that it is a serious matter when four commissioners write a letter to the White House criticizing the chairman for creating a chilled work environment. These allegations should be taken seriously, which the White House has done. And I don't plan to be a referee. I believe that you should be able to rework out these disputes among yourselves. Based on my review of this issue, however, I also believe that the current chair chairman has exhibited one of the strongest safety records of any previous NRC chairman. I would urge anybody interested in this issue to read the harrowing transcripts of the recordings from the Emergency Operations Center stood up by the chairman to help the people of Japan and the United States citizens in close proximity to Fukushima and danger zone. You will be impressed by the skill and courage of those who worked around the clock to prevent this disaster from, be far, from becoming far worse. As a result, I am struggling to determine how much of this squabbling relates to personality conflicts and how much relates to a fundamental disagreement about the statutory structure of the Commission itself. The Inspector General, after interviewing all five Commissioners and senior NRC staff, concluded that the Chairman acted within his authority. The General Counsel of the NRC agreed after examining the Chairman's actions relating to Fukushima. He wrote in an opinion that the Chairman's actions fit within his authorities. Similar, similarly, our Committee's own investigation, which has included transcribed interviews of 15 senior NRC staff and the review of thousands of documents, has uncovered no violations of law or instances in which the safety of U.S. nuclear facilities have been placed in jeopardy. The truth is that when Congress reorganized the NRC 
1980, he created a structure with a very strong chairman. As President Carter said at the time, the experience of the Three Mile Island demonstrated that the Commission as a whole cannot deal expeditiously with emergencies. For, moreover, this is not the first time there has been conflict between the NRC chairman and the other commissioners. A 1999 report by the Inspector General described a very similar situation and found that the statutory structure of the NRC leads to tensions between the chairman and other commissioners. Finally, the natural question is where do we go from here? Based on the letters all five commissioners have sent to the committee in preparation for today's hearing, I believe they are all willing to fulfill the fundamental mission of the NRC. I sincerely hope that we can use today's hearing as an opportunity to get beyond past differences and refocus our energies on the goal of nuclear safety. And I remind the commissioners, when the hearing is over, when the lights are down and the cameras are out and the reporters are gone, you all still have to return to your workplace and work together to protect the safety of all Americans. And with that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. I now recognize the uh, chairman of the Subcommittee on Regulatory Affairs, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan, for five minutes for an opening statement. I, I thank the chairman, and I will be, uh, be very brief. And, and I just want to thank the chairman for having <clears throat> this important hearing today and remind the committee that this is in no way a partisan issue. This is, this is about an important commission. Um, who seems to be, based on some of the things we have said, uh, not functioning the way we would want, maybe even use the term dysfunctional. And I think it is important to hear from all of them, ask the appropriate questions and get to the bottom of this. This is a commission charged with making sure nuclear power plants are safe, and that is an important task. That is all about good government, and this is the appropriate venue to have this, uh, this discussion and this hearing. So I just want to thank the chairman and would yield back the balance of my time. I know the ranking member of our committee wants to make an opening statement as well. I thank the gentleman. We now recognize the ranking member of that same subcommittee, the other gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, uh, for calling this hearing. Safety is the, is the issue. I take it personally. This affects my state and my area. In February 2001, the NRC began investigating an aging mechanism that often caused cracking in reactors. As a result of these findings, in late September 2001, the NRC determined that the davis Bessey plant was at risk and should shut down by December 31, 2001. First Energy, the owner of the davis Bessey plant, uh, which is in Port Clinton, Ohio, resisted the order, claiming that it could stay open without incident until March 2002. First Energy argued that a shutdown would cause an unnecessary financial burden. Rather than following its own safety procedures and shutting down davis Bessey, the NRC relented and allowed the plant to operate until February 2002. After the plant had been shut down, workers repairing one of the five crack control rod nozzles discovered extensive damage to the reactor vessel head. The workers found a large corroded crater the size of a football in the reactor vessel head next to one of the nozzles. Only three sixteenths of an inch of steel remained intact at the bottom. That began to bulge uh, and crack. The NRC later found that the plant might have been as close as 60 days from bursting. If it did, they would have had a major release of radioactivity. It would have jeopardized the immediate and long-term safety of millions of Americans, not to mention the single biggest source of fresh water in the world being jeopardized in the Great Lakes. The Government Accountability Office later weighed in on this, calling it, quote, the most serious safety issue confronting the nation's commercial nuclear industry since Three Mile Island. The Department of Justice said that First Energy admitted that they knowingly, quote, knowingly made false representations to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the course of attempting to persuade the NRC that its davis Bessey nuclear power station was safe to operate beyond December 31, 2001, unquote. First Energy's insurance company became worried and commissioned an independent study to analyze the data from the incident. The study, which was released in April 2007, painted an even darker picture that the regulatory rebukes that, uh, then the regulatory rebukes that came before it. The report found that the corrosion of the steel plate happened at a faster rate than was reported by First Energy, bringing the reactor closer to a catastrophe incident than had previously been reported. Now, despite the finding of these three bodies, just a few weeks before that study was released, First Energy asked the NRC to remove the requirement for independent assessments of davis Bessey's operations. They asked for less oversight. The NRC's 2004 confirmatory 
order modifying license lists some of First Energy's malfeasant policies and actions that led to the 2002 incident, providing more evidence that profits were prioritized over safety. It specifically lists the key reasons the leak was allowed to persist and grow. First Energy's self-policing mechanisms failed. Worst, First Energy tried to convince the NRC the problems were solved when, in fact, they were not. First Energy continues to try to prioritize profits over safety. Since I don't have time here to cover in detail the full history of First Energy's bad decisions, near misses, and safety lapses, I ask unanimous consent to place into the record a document prepared by Beyond Nuclear, which just which does that, Mr. Chairman. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, several weeks ago, First Energy had to shut down Davis Bessie to replace yet another reactor head because its design has flaws uh, which uh, uh, creates leaking problems. In doing so, they found cracks in a building designed to protect the core from external missiles like planes, but also to prevent the release of radioactive air and steam in the event of a problem with the reactor. The latter scenario is what almost happened in 2001 at Davis Bessie and is exactly what happened at Fukushima when the containment buildings blew up from the steam buildup. A structurally compromised building affords less protection to protect the public. True to form, there were important differences between the story First Energy told the public and the real story, which I only uncovered because of my own investigation and because of my staff specifically. First Energy tried to convince the public that the cracks were only cosmetic in nature, were few in number, and were not widely distributed. None of the above was accurate, and yet First Energy was eager to restart Davis Bessie, even though they know it will not, uh, even though they will not know the cause of the cracking until February. We should be looking at this. The corporations that run nuclear power plants are fundamentally no different than the corporations that drove our economy off a cliff. They will cut corners to maintain or increase profits in the absence of sufficient incentives to act differently. They must be sufficiently and carefully regulated. The consequences of failing to do so are unthinkable. I hope, I will, uh, I will, I hope we'll, we will reflect uh, on the NRC's uh, position here and help uh, to achieve a culture of independence, objectivity, and public interest uh, over corporate interest, and that will have complete dedication to safety. I thank the Chair for calling this hearing and for your attention to this critical matter at this time. I thank the gentleman, and uh, I look back fondly on the years we have worked on this issue together on the committee, uh, with each of us at different times being a subcommittee chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> we now recognize our panel of witnesses. Mr. Gregory Jasko is the chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. The chairman is a, I think, a particle physicist, to be more accurate, and an experienced policy advisor who has served in the commission since 2005 and has served on both sides of the dome, both in the House and the Senate, in the past. Commissioner Christine, uh, I'm going to try this again, Shiznicki? Spinicky. Shivinki. Okay. And I grew up near Slavic Village, and I'm just, I should be able to do these names better. Uh, is an experienced nuclear engineer, a policy advisor who came to the Commission in 2008. Commissioner William Magwood, the fourth. Commissioner Magwood joined the Commission just in 2010. He previously served seven years as Director of Nuclear Energy at the Department of Energy. Commissioner William Ostendorf, Commissioner Ostendorf came to the Commission last year after a distinguished career in the Nuclear Navy and much time also with the Department of Energy. And then Commissioner George Erpostolakis, thank you for being understanding. The Commissioner is an expert in risk assessment and came to the Commission in 2010 after many years as a professor at MIT. Gentlemen and lady, pursuant to the rules of the committee, all witnesses here will be sworn. Would you please rise to take the oath and raise your right hands? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record indicate all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Please be seated. As I said earlier, nobody on the dais here knows anything other than what we have heard. 
you are here today, so we hear all of you. So uh, I, will, uh, I will ask you to, uh, to try to come close to five minutes. I am not going to gavel people if they are going through with their statements. And uh, I am likely also going to be very generous in your response times so that we can fully hear from all of you here today. Uh, Chairman Jasko, would you please go first? Well, thank you, Chairman Issa and Ranking Member Cummings and members of the committee. We have been asked to appear before you today to discuss the management and operations of the United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission. This year, 2011, has been an exceptionally challenging and productive year for the NRC. And as usual, the NRC staff has done an outstanding job over the past year, and the agency once again scored among the top tier of Federal agencies in the 2011 Best Places to Work in the Federal Government rankings, scoring number one in all four major indices. At the NRC, we anticipated that 2011 would be a busy but unexpected issues, most notably the Fukushima Daiichi accident and multiple natural disasters, including flooding in the Midwest in June, the earthquake on the East Coast in August, and other serious threats, such as hurricanes and tornadoes, created additional pressures for the staff at NRC's headquarters and regional offices. In spite of those challenges, the staff and the Commission remained focused on our critical safety mission. During the past fiscal year, we performed thousands of hours of inspections at nuclear power plants and materials sites, took hundreds of enforcement actions, reviewed more than 1,000 licensing actions and tasks, and issued a number of new regulations. And we completed a very important final safety uh, final safety culture policy statement. The NRC has conducted a greater number of special inspections in the past year, 21 to date, than at any point in recent memory. During the past year, we completed the safety and environmental reviews of the first two new reactor combined license applications and held mandatory hearings on both of these applications. And these were both historic uh, actions by the Commission. We issued final safety evaluation reports for the AP1000 and ESBWR design certifications and issued eight reactor license renewals. We also successfully completed two pilot applications for transition to our new risk-informed, performance-based approach to fire protection. And we had held a meeting yesterday to talk about the progress that is being made on that issue. We issued three new uranium recovery licenses authorized the restart of one uranium recovery facility and issued the license for the Arriva Eagle Rock Centrifuge in Richmond facility to be built in Idaho. We also completed the orderly closeout of our Yucca Mountain activities and preserved the technical work in three technical reports, more than 40 other reports, and in videotaped staff interviews. We have also approved cybersecurity plans for all nuclear power plants, published approximately 30 new guidance documents, and hosted the first in integrated regulatory review service mission to the United States, and that is an international peer review mission that is done under the auspices of the At International Atomic Energy Agency. Now, the Commission itself was also incredibly productive in 2011. My colleagues and I held 38 public Commission meetings, 10 closed meetings, and issued 92 staff requirements memoranda on substantive Commission voting matters. This was 30 more substantive Commission decisions than we completed in fiscal year 2010. And in line with our commitment to transparency and openness, we noticed more than 1,030 public meetings and improved and expanded our public outreach. Construction of our new third headquarters building is also on schedule and on budget for opening in late 2012. And of course, the NRC undertook tremendous efforts in response to the March 11th earthquake and tsunami in Japan and the nuclear emergency at Fukushima Daiichi. In addition to monitoring the crisis and providing on-the-ground support in Japan, the Commission established a task force to review the accident and make recommendations to the Commission for enhancing reactor safety. This task force reported back with a comprehensive set of 12 safety recommendations addressing a broad range of issues. These recommendations have on undergone additional reviews by the NRC staff, our Advisory Committee on Reactor Safeguards, and we have benefited from the insights of a broad range of stakeholders. The Commission has directed the staff to begin immediately implementing partially or fully five of the safety recommendations from the task force and set goals of completing station blackout rulemaking within 24 to 30 months and has encouraged completion of all actions within five years. 
Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the committee, this concludes my formal testimony today, and I would be pleased to respond to any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Commissioner Svinicki, I will get to it eventually. Thank you, Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the committee for the opportunity to appear before you today. You have requested that members of this Commission address the topic of management and leadership issues at the NRC. I have been privileged to serve as a Commissioner of the NRC for over three and a half years. During this time, the agency's approximately 4,000 technical, legal, and administrative staff members have impressed me with their professionalism and their unyielding commitment to the NRC's important missions of nuclear safety and nuclear security. Their efforts are led by a skilled group of senior executive service managers, most of whom have decades of experience, not just in Federal service, but specifically at the NRC. I have confidence in the work they do and believe the Nation is well served by their constant vigilance on matters of nuclear safety and security. I appear before you today, however, to address topics related to the current functioning of the Commission itself and the engagement between the Commission and the agency staff. I have served as a Commissioner with six other individuals, four currently serving and two whose service on the Commission has ended, and under the tenure of two different chairmen. Although some amount of tension is expected in any deliberative body, I believe the level of tension among the currently serving members of this Commission is impeding the collegial processes of the NRC and is obstructing the functioning of key processes between the Commission and the agency staff. These tensions are rooted in an interpretation of the NRC Chairman's statutory authorities, as well as his conduct toward his Commissioner colleagues and the NRC staff. Despite these problems, I believe it is likely that the Commission would have continued its tug-of-war over these issues to the extent possible out of the public spotlight. Events of the past few months, however, pushed the Commission beyond its tolerance for current circumstances and led us to communicate our concerns beyond the Commission. As a result of interpretations of the NRC Chairman's authorities that grant the Chairman the authority to decide which issues appropriately involve any of the Commission's statutory functions and to interpret for the agency staff the meaning of direction issuing from Commission decisions, the situation at the NRC has, in my view, become increasingly unworkable and threatens the viability of a functioning Commission structure. While the Reorganization Plan No. 1 of 1980 created certain administrative responsibilities, concentrated certain administrative responsibilities in the hands of the Chairman, the legislative history makes clear that it was not intended to displace the ultimate authority of the full Commission over the affairs of the agency. The plan itself includes a provision that the Commission may decide by majority vote in any area of doubt whether any matter pertains to one of the Commission's statutory function. In its deliberations on the plan, Congress also emphasized that the Commission shall have full access to all information within the agency, including that in existence and that which requires development by the staff. The Chairman may not withhold or delay providing information requested by the Commission. In both of these critical areas, however, I do not believe that the processes under the current Chairman satisfy the intent of the law. Over the past year and a half, the Commission has engaged in a protracted effort to resolve its disagreements over its respective roles and responsibilities through a comprehensive revision of its internal operating procedures. This effort proved ultimately unfruitful, however, in resolving the underlying disagreements. Exacerbating these longstanding disagreements are recent events of concern that have come to the Commission's attention. In October of this year, the Chairman appeared at an annual retreat held by the agency's Executive Director for Operations and senior agency staff. Within days of this event, a number of attendees from the retreat sought me out to express their strong reaction to the Chairman's statements. They described the content of his remarks as an expression of contempt for the Commission. It was described to me that the Chairman instructed those present to advance his agenda and that this must come at the price of having their own independent assessments and recommendations. The Executive Director for Operations described it to me by saying, we were pretty much instructed to leave our brains at home. Hearing of this event was a formative moment in leading me to conclude that the points of tension between the Chairman and the Commission were no longer isolated to the Commission itself. Interference in the flow of information coming to the Commission was occurring to such a, per a pervasive extent and was being conducted so brazenly that the Commission needed to take additional action. Another circumstance that I believe caused the Commission to bring these issues forward is the Chairman's continued outbursts of abusive rage directed at subordinates within the agency staff. 
All members of the Commission, including me, have been on the receiving end of this conduct, which was also acknowledged by the NRC Inspector General in his testimony before the House Energy and Commerce Committee, Subcommittee on Environment and the Economy, earlier this year. These incidents appear to have grown more frequent, however, and I am now aware of this conduct being directed against staff at various levels in the agency. Some of these employees have spoken to me privately of the embarrassment and humiliation of being made to lose their composure in front of their colleagues or to be seen exiting the Chairman's office in a state of obvious upset. I regret that we have come to this point, but our agency, one whose fundamental mission is to ensure the health, safety, and security of the American public, is premised on the variability of individuals to speak out. It is my hope that a positive lesson about the willingness to speak out will be drawn by not just the NRC staff listening to this hearing, but by all those responsible for safety and security across our government. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Magwood. If you could pull the mic just a little closer, they are not very good from a distance. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Yes. Uh, chairman Issa, Ranking, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the committee, it is with considerable disappointment that I appear before you today to share my concerns regarding the management and leadership issues facing the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. I provided a written statement that has to be included in the record, so I will try to summarize my comments. Without objection, so ordered. Let me begin by reassuring the public that the NRC staff has and continues to work diligently to carry out its responsibilities to protect the health, safety, and security of the American people. They are led by an excellent cadre of senior career managers who have done a fantastic job of insulating most of the staff from the serious problems that are the subject of this hearing. My colleagues and I have endured a rather distasteful and dishonest media campaign over the last week. We have seen a wide range of misleading and untrue reports about our motivations, our characters, and our commitment to safety. It is quite clear that this campaign is intended to divert the attention of Congress and the public from the very real concerns that we have about the leadership of our agency. I do not intend to allow this tactic to succeed. However, one item I feel I must address concerns this Commission's commitment to safety. After 20 months of working with the people at this table, I can promise you that we all place the safety and security of the public we serve at the very top of our considerations. We do not always agree on how to achieve the goal of safety, but we, and we always do not view, view the issues the same way. But I believe we are all equally committed to the same goal, to impute the motivations of members of the Commission because of disagreements on strategy or approaches is irresponsible. Now, as I discuss the real concerns facing us, I feel my true role before you today is to give voice to the dedicated men and women who serve the NRC, many of whom have come to me to discuss their concerns. First, I am most concerned that the Chairman has made a regular practice of interfering with the ability of the Commission to obtain information from the NRC staff. He has asserted the authority to decide what information is provided to the Commission, when it is provided, and increasingly what the information contains when it reaches the Commission. This behavior is contrary to both the letter and intent of the reorganization plan, and no Commission could confidently carry out its legal obligations under these conditions. In my written statement, I outline a specific example in which the Chairman prevented the staff from providing the Commission a voting paper regarding our program for fire protection at nuclear power plants. He went as far as to send someone to break up a staff briefing being held for myself and another Commissioner. For the record, we do not allow the briefing to end. It has become routine for individual members of the staff to come to Commissioners to alert us about issues they believe require Commission attention, but that staff can't get through the Chairman. That the Commission has come to rely on the personal bravery of individuals on the staff to keep us informed is a very sad statement. But what worries me most is the fact we don't know what we don't know. The second concern I raise is the growing cancer of a chilled work environment at the agency. As I outlined in my written statement, I have observed the effects of this chilled environment firsthand, and I believe the situation has actually worsened in recent months. And I think Commissioner Savinicki mentioned some of that. I would like to move on to my final concern, however. Which I, which I raise the, concerning the uh, Chairman's abusive behavior towards the staff. To understand this matter, I spoke with three of the women who have had personal experience with the Chairman's extreme behavior. These women re remain very disturbed by these experiences. A common reflection they all shared with me was, I didn't deserve this. One woman said she felt the Chairman was actually irritated with someone else but took it out on her. Another told me she was angry at herself for being brought to tears in front of male colleagues. A third described how she couldn't stop shaking after her experience. She sat talking through what had happened to her with her supervisor until she could calm down enough to drive home. 
Senior female staff in an agency like NRC are tough, smart women who have succeeded in a male-dominated environment. Enduring this type of abuse and being reduced to tears in front of colleagues and subordinates is a profoundly painful experience for them. The word one woman used was humiliated. I must note that none of these women want to have their names used publicly. As another woman told me, it is embarrassing enough that I went through this. I don't want to be dragged through the mud before some congressional committee. These are major concerns facing the agency today, blocking staff from providing information to the Commission, the creation of a chilled work environment, and the abuse of NRC staff. I do not believe that the fear, intimidation, and humiliation of the acceptable leadership tax in any organization, least of all the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Thank you for your attention. I stand ready to answer any of your questions. I thank you. Commissioner. Thank you, Chairman, Ranking Member Cummings, members of the committee for the chance to be here before you today. I served on this independent commission since April 2010. During that time, I have come to better appreciate the reputation the NRC has historically enjoyed as a competent regulator and a leader in nuclear safety, not only in the United States, but also in the international community. The reputation can be attributed to the employees of the NRC who have shown dedication to the safety mission and the NRC's organizational values of integrity, service, openness, commitment, cooperation, excellence, and respect. For decades, these values have served as a guide for the operations of the NRC staff as well as for the Commission. These values have also historically fostered an open and collaborative workplace that brings out the best regulatory and technical judgments of the NRC staff without undue influence or pressure. Unfortunately, we find ourselves today in an environment where those historical values have been compromised and the agency's reputation placed at great risk. Left uncorrected, this trend damages the ability of the NRC staff and the Commission to carry out its nuclear safety mission for this country. I have over 30 years of service to this country. As a Rickover Air nuclear trained submarine officer, I served in six submarines. I commanded a nuclear attack submarine for three years. I had subsequent command of an attack submarine squadron of eight submarines. I have been personally accountable to the United States Government and the White House the Department of Defense for ensuring the safety of nuclear-powered warships. I take great pride in that service and in my own decision-making with respect to those principles that best ensure reactor safety. After retiring from the Navy in 2002, I worked upstairs to the House Armed Services Committee as a counsel with oversight responsibility for atomic energy activities at the Department of Energy. Subsequent to that, I spent two years as a senior official at the Department of Energy, now with NRC. With significant experience in leadership positions dealing with nuclear oversight, whether it be nuclear weapons or nuclear power, I can honestly say to this committee that I have never seen an environment where the highest level of the organization does not reflect the values shared by the whole. Along with the three of my Commissioner colleagues who signed the letter on October 13th, who took the same oath to, quote, well and faithfully discharge the duties, unquote, of our office, I refused to be silent while damage was being done to the NRC's work environment. It is important to comment briefly on what I will label as an unprecedented action, the four of us writing a letter to the White House. That is the letter that this committee received last Thursday evening. This letter is not about politics. It is signed by two Democratic and two Republican members of this Commission. I regret that that letter has been portrayed by many in Congress over the last three or four days as being politically motivated. I assure this committee it is not. It is not about Yucca Mountain. It is not about other policy disagreements. It is not about internal conflict between Commissioners, though that is one element of our concerns. With great respect for the White House, I must take strong exception to White House Chief of Staff Daley's letter from Monday night that I believe mischaracterized the situation at the Commission. What is this letter about? This letter is about management actions that have significantly eroded the prized, open and collaborative work environment of the NRC, our Nation's Nuclear Safety Agency. These actions have served to prevent the Commission from being fully informed of the NRC staff's views and recommendations. It is about behavior that, if exhibited by one of our NRC's regulated licensees, would be subject to investigation and potential enforcement action for a chilled work environment. It is about bullying and intimidating behavior towards NRC career staff that should not 
and cannot be tolerated. In light of our unanimous agreement that these actions cannot continue, the four of us fulfilled our oath of office and took what we viewed as appropriate action and wrote the White House. That letter clearly states our grave concerns. I appreciate this committee's oversight role. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Commissioner. Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings and members of the committee, good morning. Management and operation of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is an important subject. My perspective is grounded in my experience and observations as a member of the Commission since being sworn in on April 23, 2010, and my former role as a 15-year member and chairman for two years of the Advisory Committee on Reactor Safeguards, a statutory committee of technical experts. Management and operation of the Commission are carried out within an overall structure of law and policy. The Commission's independent and multi-member character with staggered terms for its members is designed to insulate regulatory decisions from political consideration and to provide stability for regulatory policy. Nuclear safety matters are technically complex. This Commission structure allows for a diversity of insights to be brought to bear in the Commission's decision-making. Under Reorganization Plan No. 1 of 1980, the Commission as a whole formulates policy and regulations, issues orders, and conducts adjudication. Policy formulation includes major administrative decisions with policy implications. The Commission has ultimate authority to determine by majority vote in an area of doubt whether any matter, action, question, or area of inquiry pertains to one of these functions. The Senate Committee on Governmental Affairs, in reporting on the reorganization plan, declared that, quote, the Committee also intends the Commission to exercise the authority to interpret the plan, end quote. The legislative history of the plan and the presidential messages to Congress in submitting the plan emphasize that the Chairman is subject to the policies of the Commission and the oversight authority of the Commission. As Principal Executive Officer of the Commission, the Chairman has the ultimate responsibility to the Commission and the public for the proper day-to-day -day management and administration of the agency. However, the Chairman is statutorily responsible to the Commission for assuring that the Executive Director of Operations and the staff are responsive to the requirements of the Commission in the performance of its functions. The 1980 Reorganization Plan also provides that the heads of the offices of the General Counsel, the Secretary of the Commission, and the Advisory Committee on Reactor Safeguards shall continue to report directly to the Commission. The Chairman and the Executive Director, through the Chairman, are responsible for ensuring that the Commission is fully and currently informed about matters within the Commission's functions. The reporting relationship of the Executive Director to the Chairman is not intended to interfere with the ability of the EDO to make independent recommendations on matters that the Commission has delegated to him. While the Chairman has special responsibility for policy planning and development for the Commission, the Commission could not function in any satisfactory way if the Executive Director or other senior managers were required to misrepresent or suppress their views or analyses. The Commission is well served by its dedicated staff with many senior managers who bring long experience and advanced technical expertise. Their technical evaluations are essential to informed Commission decision making. The transmission of adequate information and unbiased perspectives to the Commission for its decision-making and oversight is essential to the agency's mission of protecting public health and safety. I joined my fellow Commissioners to formally express our serious concerns regarding the Chairman's leadership. I regret that partisan or other ill motives have been ascribed to the action that we have taken. This could not be further from the truth. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to thank all of you for staying well under the five minutes. And again, all of your full written statements are uh, by committee uh, rule uh, going to be in the record. I recognize myself for five minutes. Chairman, 
who is your board of directors? For the, for the people out there and sort of, you know, they don't know government necessarily, what is the equivalent of your board of directors? Who, who do you report to? Well, I would say it is, uh, I am responsible uh, as the, the chairman of the commission to carrying out the, the policies that the commission as a whole. Uh, well, no, I, I appreciate that, but are you the CEO in your opinion? Uh, I believe the statute describes the chairman as a principal executive. So that would probably be the question. So you view yourself as the chief executive officer, Correct. the chairman. Who is your board of directors? Uh, I would say it is probably a combination of uh, the, the, the commission, uh, but the Congress as well, I think, serves a, a role in its oversight capacity to oversee the, the operation. Uh, Do these gentlemen and lady sitting next to you, are they your board? I, I think, yeah, that is certainly one way to, to characterize uh, the commission as a structure that way, that they are responsible for um, uh, establishing the policies of the agency, as I am a member of that as well. Right. But if, if some, one of these four other members brings a, asks for a vote on something and four of them vote that what you are doing is wrong, do you consider that to be per persuasive, interesting, or obligatory? Well, certainly, if the Commission uh, takes an action and we have formal procedures to, uh, to carry out our actions, then, of course, those are actions that I, I would follow. So if they ask to vote not to be locked out of getting information, as has been alleged under oath here, uh, would you consider that that was your responsibility to ensure that they had full access to information and never again were in any way denied any information that you had? Yeah, the, I, I believe the Commission has provided a tremendous amount of information. No, no, no. Chairman, we are real funny about this here. We want the answer exactly to the question we asked. Is it true that any information that you had has ever been withheld from any of these people on your request? Not that I am aware of. So you have never asked to have any information. So basically, one of the Commissioners just lied under oath is what you are saying. Well, I, I work uh, every day to uh, ensure that the Commission has the information it needs to carry out no, no, no. responsibility. No, no, no. Not the, what it needs. If I understand the statute, they have full and unfettered, just as you do, rights to everything because they determine, as I understand it, as any Commission would, and we produce Commissions here all the time, they have to have everything, or at least everything they think they have. And what they don't know they have a right to ask and know whether they really need to know it. Isn't that true? Uh, absolutely. And, and the Commission routinely asks for information, and that information is provided. Okay. Well, obviously, they disagree with you a little bit. You have a background. You are a physicist, uh, not in nuclear, but in, in interesting stuff that I don't know anything about. So I will just figure you are smarter than me on, on anything related to the science. But have you ever run an organization of 4,000 people? I know this is the first time that I've done that. What's the largest organization in which you were the CEO of in your career? Uh, well, I was responsible for managing uh, uh, my uh, my personal staff uh, and as a as a commissioner, and uh, prior to that, I served in policy capacities. So, half a dozen or something like that. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, commissioner uh, Ossendorf, uh, as a Navy captain, how many people worked for you? I had, several different jobs. I had several different jobs in the Navy as commanding officer of a submarine. I had 150 people as commanding officer of a nuclear attack submarine squadron, 1,200. As principal deputy administrator at NSA, I was a chief operating officer for 2,500 personnel who were feds and 32,000 people who were management and operating contractors. And from your leadership training over 30 years, from your years in the Navy, an autocratic organization, an organization in which you can go to jail for not obeying the lawful order of the ship's captain, you have said, signing on with the other commissioners, that this chairman has exceeded any semblance of the kind of authority that you believe he should have in his conduct, that he has had conduct, if I understand correctly, that does, and I know there is some debate about this, it does endanger safety because it is conduct that is demoralizing to an organization that, in fact, if my nuclear power plants in, in my district, if they had somebody like Chairman Jasko is alleged to be, you would shut down that site. You would view them as dysfunctional enough to be unsafe. Isn't that true? I would say, Chairman, I think I understand your question correctly, that 
I do not believe that we have been kept fully informed of our staff's views and their technical analysis, their recommendations on more than one issue here in the last few months that directly could impact how we proceed with respect to the Fukushima reactor accident. I will not ask unanimous consent for 30 more seconds to have Commissioner Magwood, who I think talked on the same subject, uh, if he has anything to say. Um, no, I, I think I would just simply add that um, I, there are clearly cases where my um, office has asked for information and been told we couldn't have it, and it's just it's very black and white to me. So the chairman it was less than truthful in saying that he's provided you information you requested always. Well, I, I don't want to sit here and say that someone's not telling the truth. I just simply will tell you what my experience has been. Thank you. The gentleman from uh, Maryland, the ranking member, is recognized for five minutes. Right, actually, make that six, please. Yes, thanks. <clears throat> uh, Commissioner Savicki, first of all, I want to uh, thank you for I want to thank all of you for your testimony. You know, I'm, I'm just sitting here and I'm just wondering what's going to happen after you go back. You know, we, we, we have no, uh, we are not experts up here on, uh, you know, dis dysfunction. The country at 8 percent says the Congress isn't functioning very well at all. So I don't want to sit here and tell you how to conduct your business. But I am concerned about uh, some of the statements that have been made, uh, particularly Chairman Jasko, with women feeling uh, intimidated. That alarms me. As a father of two daughters, it does concern me. I want you to address that, um, please. Well, I, I mean, how do you feel about that? Is it true? I mean, do you think that's true? Uh, I'm very passionate about safety, uh, and all the things that I do at the agency are directed uh, towards doing what I think is the right thing for safety. Uh, I, uh, when I heard the incident, uh, about the incident that uh, I believe Commissioner Sfinicky is, is referring to, uh, I tried to think through all the many meetings we had had together where we had had very uh, good discussions, sometimes uh, disagreements. <laughs> Uh, about policy issues, and uh, I believe there is one meeting that, uh, that she may have been referring to. Uh, as I recall the meeting, I went to her office to speak with her uh, about a, a letter, I believe it was. Uh, uh, at a certain point, we were discussing it, uh, and she uh, became concerned. Uh, and I, I, as I recall, I simply motioned. I said, let's just sit down, uh, let's just calm down, and, and let's just work through it. Uh, we continued to, to discuss it, and, uh, and then uh, at some point I left. Uh, the, the is, this, is this a situation uh, when you all go back? I mean, you apologize, have you not? Certainly, if, if any, I, this, in many of these uh, instances, I, this is the first time I have heard many of these, uh, these accusations. Uh, and uh, certainly, if there has ever been a time when I have made someone feel uncomfortable, uh, I always like to know. Uh, so that I can take whatever actions necessary to remedy that. Yeah. The uh, Commissioner Suzuki, um, you testified before the Senate Committee on Environment and Public Works that you were never told that the Chairman was operating under his e emergency authority until the uh, NRC Office of Congressional Affairs informed uh, the Senate. Do you remember exactly when that was and how far after the earthquake and the tsunami uh, did you find out? I, um, I, I don't recall the, the specific time period. If I recall the question that was posed before the Senate committee, I think it was that was I informed that the chairman had invoked his emergency authorities under Section 3A. So it was a very specific question about invocation of a provision of law. And I indicated that I learned of that when the Office of Congressional Affairs responded to a committee request. I don't recall how many months after the Fukushima event that was, sir. Well, our committee staff conducted a transcribed interview with the NRC general counsel uh, who took a different view, and th this is what he said. He said, I have heard testimony that they were not informed that the chairman was exercising his emergency power. However, the commissioners all were informed that the operations center had gone into this monitoring mode soon after the Fukushima earthquake, and actually the beginning concerns for the reactors, Fukushima reactors that had occurred. That Saturday, March 12th, I sat in on a conference call in which the chairman told each of the commissioners, I believe each one of them was on the conference call, was explaining what was going on with respect to the reactor. Um, Commissioner, were you on that call? 
I was, sir, and if I, if I may say that um, the general counsel's response indicated that we were informed the agency was in the monitoring mode. Mm -hmm. the, the difference or the misunderstanding is that, in, in my view, that does not correlate directly to invocation of emergency authorities. The agency going into the monitoring mode does not necessarily invoke those emergency authorities under law. And it, it seems fairly obvious that if the Commission was operating an emergency operations center, the Commission was responding to an emergency. Is that you, that's not, you disagree with that? The, the agency has numerous times gone into the monitoring mode where the chairman of the agency has not invoked the emergency authorities. So I do not correlate being notified of being in the monitoring mode as an immediate invocation of those authorities, sir. Okay. But, but, but you are, but there was an emergency operation. Is that right? I know that I'm yes, and other than the term being the same, uh, again, and I apologize if, the, if my answer is complicated, it is simply that the agency going into a monitoring mode does not necessarily correlate or immediately invoke those emergencies. So is your main objection that you did not receive some sort of a paper stating explicitly or, or, or by the way, we are having the emergency? Is that, is that a fair statement? But this, the significance to me of the invocation of the emergency authorities is that under the reorganization plan at that point, the chairman has taken the authorities of the commission as a whole, and then in an emergency he is able to exercise singularly the authorities of the commission as a body. Well, so I do see a distinction. Well, perhaps, uh, Chairman Jasko, could you clear, clear that up? Uh, when did you inform them uh, that uh, we were operating an emerg under the emergency uh, provisions? Well, the, the first uh, action was uh, very early on, on March 11th at about 9.43 uh, in the morning, I believe. My, one of my staff members indicated to their staff that we were entering monitoring mode. Uh, about 20 minutes later, a formal agency email went out. Uh, I then, uh, later that evening, and this is all on the first day, March 11th, uh, sent an email to my colleagues informing them uh, that we were in monitoring mode and talked about our response and what we were doing to the accident. Uh, from that point on, we had uh, e uh, meetings at least three times a day uh, where uh, their staff were briefed by members of the Operations Center about our activities and our status. Uh, I uh, held uh, approximately once a day and starting on March 12th, uh, briefing phone calls with them to describe our actions and uh, indicate what we were doing uh, as an agency to respond to the emergency. I see my time is expiring. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. We now go to the chairman of the subcommittee, Mr. Jordan, for five minutes. I thank the, uh, the chairman. Uh, Mr. Uh, let me start with Mr. Ostendorf. Um, on October 13th, you all sent a letter to the White House Chief of Staff. Is, is, uh, that seems pretty unprecedented to me, that you would have uh, two Democrats, two Republicans on a commission send a letter to the Chief of Staff of the, of the White House about the activities of the chairman of this commission. Um, do you know if there's any other examples of that happening, other commissions where, where the same kind of activity or same kind of action was taken, a letter sent to the White House Chief of Staff? Mr. Jordan, I, I agree it's an unprecedented action. I'm not aware of any other similar situation. So you guys, you guys knew that this was, this was something that had not been done before. This was pretty unprecedented. I think uh, the four of us uh, were not aware of any circumstance in which a similar action was taken by Independent Regulatory Commission. And my guess is you had, you had several discussions amongst the four of you about taking this unprecedented action. Can, that, can you elaborate on that? Was there, a, was there a time frame where over a period of months, maybe even longer, where weeks or months or longer you talked about taking this uh, unprecedented action? We have had significant concerns for a number of months. When the, and this is in the, the committee's report, it is in our letter to the, um, to the White House, concern on withdrawal of a SECI paper back in July, associated with staff recommendations on how the Fukushima uh, report should be evaluated and prioritized by our staff. That paper was withdrawn by the chairman. That caused significant concern among the four of us. We discussed our concerns with the chairman. We saw attempts to remove the executive director for operations, the EDO, which is a significant personnel step to remove the yep. senior career person in the agency. We saw the uh, October 5th meeting that Commissioner Svenicky referred to where the Chairman made statements to senior executives in our agency that uh, appeared to undermine the Commission. That was the uh, crossing line, for the, at least from my own standpoint, and I think uh, my colleagues, uh, you can ask them, agreed, and that was what uh, Safe to say, 
uh, well thought out over a period of time, discussed thoroughly, and you said the, the situation warrants us taking this unprecedented action? We had seen that our attempts to talk to the Chairman about our concerns on various matters had not yielded any difference in behavior or actions in this part. We felt that as Commissioners we had an obligation to the United States to do this. And uh, can I go down the line, Commissioner, with, with each of you? Is it, it's, would, would you agree with the assessment given by Mr. Ostendorf? Uh, yes, sir, I would. And I would add that we had engaged, as I said, in protracted efforts to attempt through our own procedures to try to resolve some of these issues that had not borne any fruit. Commissioner Magwin, accurate? Yes, very accurate. And Commissioner Apostolakis? Yes, it is accurate. Okay. And, and Mr. Ostendorf, is it, we have a chart here in our material of the, the five commissioners, the professional staff, uh, uh, this, this chart here with, with I, I'm, I'm guessing, maybe 30 different uh, folks here. And obviously you can't testify for them, but is it fair to say that, that this, this, the staff that is on this page would, had real concerns about the leadership style of Mr. Jaska? This was part of your assessment and evaluation before you sent the, the correspondence to uh, the letter to the Chief of Staff. Mr. Jordan, I can tell you that prior to signing the letter, uh, I think I will speak for myself, but I think my other three colleagues would tell you the same thing, that we had had significant feedback from the senior career leadership of the agency expressing great concerns on there being a chilled environment, a lack of an open collaborative work environment, and their interface with the Chairman. Okay. And just one more question for you and then maybe the, the same question to the other Commissioners. Um, you stated in your testimony that it, it bothers you that some are alleging that the action that the four of you have taken is somehow politically motivated. You, and I think it is a, 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 certainly a stretch in, in, in the fact that it is two Democrats, two Republicans. Um, but I want to ask, do you think the actions of the Chairman have been politically motivated? His, his style of, of leadership, what, what he is doing, do you think those are politically driven? That is a difficult question, Mr. Jordan. I personally can't tell you that I think his actions are politically motivated. I, I have no evidence that they are. I will just tell you that uh, we have seen significant issues under his leadership and management that we think are unacceptable. Commissioner Savanicki? I am sorry. I'm, uh, I, I think I did a better job on the name than the Chairman, but I am I'm sure I got it wrong, too. Go ahead. It, I will not testify to political motivations of Chairman Yatsko. I would describe my motivation in signing that letter was more on the basic conduct issues. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Mr. Magwin? Yeah, I, I think I would answer the question the same way. I, I, I would never describe political motivations. Okay. My motivation was not political. I understand that. Do you think the Chairman's was? I have no evidence that it was. I think it is more his interpretation of his role as a chairman okay. that is driving his actions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We now recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Kucinich, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members of the committee, I want to quote from an article in Politico today on their front page. It says, behind closed doors they snipe at each other. In public they question each other's motives. And in front of Congress, they hang each other out to dry. That is life on the Federal Election Commission. Not the NRC, but the FEC. I, I would imagine that if we called up one commission after another in front of this Congress, uh, you would probably have some complaints that may not be dissimilar than what we have here. The difference is, though, that 104 nuclear power plants in various stages of relicensing, some of which have some questions related to safety, post Fukushima seven months ago, March 11, 2011, or May 11, 2011. I am frankly you know, wondering why, why you are here. I mean, I, I appreciate the Chairman calling this hearing. This is all gentleman, very interesting. The gentleman yield? But uh, I, I would certainly yield. Well, I would just make one point that I made in, in, in my remarks. Um, the, the one big difference is I am sure that you have some of those, those actions taking place. You cited the FEC. 
but no commission has taken the unprecedented action of having four members sign a letter and send it to the White House Chief of Staff. That is the difference, and that is why the Chairman has called this hearing. Well, well you know, I, I thank the Chairman for calling the hearing, and I thank my friend for pointing that out. But I also think that it is important for us to look beyond uh, what we see and consider that uh, you know, we have an industry that is in trouble. Wall Street won't invest in nuclear power. The nuclear industry came to this government to look for a $60 billion-plus loan guarantee. The industry is in trouble. So the commissioners are going to reflect what is going on in the industry. I mean, I would expect that is what is happening here. And that is why we need to look deeper into what we are hearing about the NRC and ask what is going on with the industry. What do the titans of the industry have to say about the chairman? Now, Mr. Uh, Yasko, an Associated Press story reported that uh, you were worried that the U.S. nuclear plant operators may have become complacent following the disaster in Japan. And according to a press account, you said that recent instances of human error and other problems have threatened the safety of some of the nation's nuclear facilities. It was reported, for example, that incidents at nuclear plants in Ohio and Nebraska, quote, almost led to workers getting very, very significant doses, unquote, of radiation. The article also reports, in addition to these events, three other plants were shut down for safety reasons. This apparently marks the first time in more than a decade that several plants in the U.S. have been shut down at the same time. Can you elaborate, Mr. Chairman, on some of these specific events and, uh, I, uh, that have occurred recently and which ones trouble you the most and why? Well, uh, Congressman, the events uh, in particular with the potential worker exposures were, in my mind, very uh, significant events because they appear to indicate a, uh, a, a lack of adherence to procedures. Uh, and after I made those comments, uh, I heard from uh, industry uh, officials, and while they may, may, may have not necessarily agreed with my assessment of complacency, they did acknowledge that there is a change in the workforce right now uh, in the nuclear industry. There is new workers, uh, and, and we are seeing some of these incidents in which uh, the new workers may not uh, have a full appreciation of the procedures and, and the need for adherence to certain processes that ultimately ensure safety. So, it's, a, it's an important signal. It's not clear yet that we're seeing a, a true decline in safety, but it's an important signal that we need to make sure we keep a close eye on uh, as, as the year goes on and, and as we continue our oversight of these plants. Is safety your top concern? Safety has been my number one priority since I came to the Commission. And, uh, I After Fukushima, to, uh, what went on in your mind about safety and nuclear power plants in this country? Well, I, first and foremost, I was proud of, of the staff at the NRC that we have worked very hard for a long time to be focused on safety. But that accident, I think, really reminded us that there is no way to rule out accidents. There is no way to, to, to prevent uh, ultimately all, kind, uh, all kinds of serious incidents. So we have to be even more vigilant and dedicated to safety than we have ever been. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My time has expired. I ask unanimous consent to place in the record a uh, staff report uh, called Regulatory Meltdown. Uh, I can only ask whose staff report? It's a staff report by Mr. Markey. Uh, I will reserve, but only for a very short period of time, uh, because it is a com another committee's report. Uh, I'll, if you'll well, I would appreciate your consent. It will only take a couple of minutes for staff to review it. Thank you. Without, we recognize the gentleman from Utah, a state that gives us uranium, <laughs> for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you for holding this, uh, this meeting. Chairman Yasko, um, you are undoubtedly aware of the uh, letter that was sent uh, to the White House, to uh, the Chief of Staff, dated October 13, 2011. There's five very serious charges in there. Number one, intimidating and bullying, bullied senior career staff, true or false? Uh, I have not bullied and intimidated career staff. Uh, true or false, ordered staff to withhold or modify policy information and recommendations intended to tran for transmission to the Commission? Uh, there is one occasion in which I discussed with uh, a very senior uh, manager uh, a recommendation that he wanted to make uh, on an issue. And so we only one time in your, the history of your time there? Uh, correct, and I have a uh, Next a one, uh, true or false, attempted to intimidate the advisory committee on react reactor safeguards, the legislative, anyway, it goes on. True or false? False. 
uh, true or false, ignored the will of the majority of the Commission, contrary to the statutory functions of the Commission? I have never uh, uh, ignored the will of the majority in an area that is a, a Commission I'll policy. take that as a false. True or false, interacted with us, his fellow Commissioners, with such intemperance and disrespect that the Commission no longer functions as effectively as it should? Well, I am um, a very passionate person about safety, uh, and I uh, often engage my colleagues in, uh, in, in discussions and, and, uh, about safety. And, uh, uh, that has been uh, my, my style and my practice. So in, other words, in other words, they are all wrong and you are exactly right. I have uh, listened very carefully to the concerns of, of my colleagues. And you have done uh, nothing wrong. Uh, I have listened very carefully to the concerns of my colleagues, and I am certainly uh, very interested in continuing the dialogue with them to better understand uh, how we are not communicating effectively. And, uh, in fact, as uh, I believe Mr. Let, let me, Taylor let me continue. My time is short, and I appreciate that, but it doesn't seem like any sort of um, repentance or concern for this. Now, are you telling me that the, uh, there was an office that the Inspector General did a report dated June 6, 2011, page 44, and I'm extracting a quote out of it, a portion of a sentence, quote, he strategically provided three of the four commissioners with varying amounts of information, unquote. Would you disagree with that? Well, the um, Inspector General found ultimately that uh, my actions were consistent with the law. They were consistent with Commission policy. But you, uh, do you policy agree or disagree with the, the Inspector General, who is an independent person, who came in and looked at this and said that you gave people varying amounts of information? Uh, I disagree with that assessment. Mr. Chairman, I, I got to tell you, and, and to my colleagues on the other side, we talk about the safety, the security of this nation, the importance of the nuclear situation in this country? This should be bipartisan. The Commission is bipartisan. We have got people who are suffering under this gentleman right here. He is not living up to the duties. I don't believe you. I think the safety and security of this nation is too important. I think you should resign. I believe in these commissioners, and God bless you for the job that you are doing and for stepping up and telling it like it is. Gentlemen, you have a question? I will not. I will not. It is too important to get this right. I, I find it very hard to believe that the distinguished careers, two Democrats, two Republicans, the host of staff that stands behind her, and an inspector general that goes out and looks at this, and you are telling me they are all wrong and you are right. That to me is a lack of leadership, and I hope, to, I hope that there is some sort of change. And if you are going to do the right thing for your country and for this commission, you should step down. I yield gentlemen yield now. Gentlemen, gentlemen, yield. gentlemen yield. Yes. Uh, I recognize that there could be disagreement on this, but, but I do have the basic question for you. In light of this accusation, do you believe, Chairman, that you need to make changes in your management and style and how you deal with your commissioners and how you keep them informed? Well, uh, certainly, uh, uh, I'm very interested in improving the communication among uh, among the five of us. Uh, and if you had to do it again, would you have invoked emergency powers without a consultation with this commission? Uh, all the actions that I took in regard to the the 50 mile or the the Japan response in general, uh, I'm very comfortable with. And, and okay, so you're comfortable authority. with a an event on the other side of the world? taking away these people's rights to have full and complete access and a vote, you are comfortable doing that without consultation, even though, in fact, it was no direct threat to the United States and they were available? You are comfortable with not consulting with them? The um, okay. That says it all. The gentleman, yield. Uh, I uh, actually, the like, time has expired. Isn't that interesting? Uh, I, well, time has expired. Oh, sure. You no, he, no. He, did you finish answering? No, 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 no. I, I, I didn't cut him off. Well, if I, you have I, further to answer. You're. I wasn't sure if you were asking me a question or uh, if you wanted a response. Well, I asked you if you were comfortable on the gentleman's time. I asked you if you were comfortable with not consulting, and you said you were comfortable with not consulting. You were comfortable with what you did, uh, when in fact it was pretty extraordinary, and it was an event on the other side of the world, and these lady and gentlemen were available, and yet. They didn't even seem to know that their powers had been usurped uh, so that you could run the show 
uh, even though none of you are not a nuclear engineer and several of these people are. So are you still comfortable with that? Well, I, I am very comfortable with the actions that we took as an agency, and I did uh, provide tremendous amounts of information uh, to my colleagues, including personally briefing them about, uh, about the status of our response and the issues that we were looking at. Their staff was fully aware uh, in multiple briefings uh, that they were provided sometimes up to four times a day on all of the issues that we were looking at. Uh, and again, it, when we are in an emergency situation like this, uh, the authorities are transferred to the chairman uh, in order to assure effective and timely decision making. And, uh, and the events in Japan, I think, uh, demonstrated that that was uh, the appropriate way to respond. We now recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts for five minutes. Thank you. And uh, just a comment to my colleague from Utah, who we generally get along pretty well. Uh, when there is a minute and 28 seconds left on the clock and somebody has asked you to yield and you deny the yield to give to somebody in your own party, it doesn't really speak the bipartisanship approach on a hearing like this. Uh, and I, I was going to ask you whether or not you totally disregard the Inspector General's findings uh, or, and wish us to. So this is going to be a bipartisan uh, hearing then I would think we would put some weight on the Inspector General's report and conclusions, which are contrary to your recommendation. Will the gentleman Honor. yield? Will the gentleman yield? Yes, I will yield. The, uh, the, the Chairman said he disagreed with the Inspector General. The Inspector General was wrong. Okay. I thank you. I reclaim my time. And I note that he disagreed with him on one quote of an entire report, but agreed with him quite fully on the conclusions in the final report itself. Look, the, for what I am reading in the statute, on this is Section 3, it says, notwithstanding Sections 1 and 2 of this reorganization plan, there are hereby transferred to the Chairman all the functions vested in the Commission pertaining to an emergency concerning a particular facility or materials licensed or regulated by the Commission, including the functions of declaring, responding, issuing orders, determining specific policies, advising the civil authorities and the public, directing and coordinating actions relative to such emergency incident. But would the gentleman in yield? At the end, I will, if I have time. In 1980, Congress enacted legislation on this. It said the Chairman will be the official spokesman of the Commission. They are hereby transferred to the Chairman all those functions that I read. To the maximum extent possible under the emergency conditions, the Chairman or other member of the Commission delegated authority under the subsection B shall inform the Commission of actions taken relative to the emergency. And following the conclusion of the emergency, the Chairman or a member of the Commission delegated to the emergency functions shall render a complete and timely report. Mr. Chairman, did you do those things uh, that the statute set out? Uh, I did, and I uh, believe I did much more. Okay, now, I am concerned that what is probably going on a large part here is a disagreement in the interpretation of what powers the Chairman has under the statute. That seems to be the underlying fact here, and that is not a new disagreement. I go all the way back to a 1999 uh, report, 1998 report uh, on this. Ambiguity regarding the Chairman's role and the Commissioner's role continues, uh, and it goes on on that basis. It lays a less than harmonious interaction. It seems that members of the Commission always think they have more responsibility. Chair people, particularly new ones, always think they have an enlarged role, and that policy resides with the full Commission and management resides with the, with the Chairman. It seems to be the same thing going on here. I look at a report done by our colleague over in the Commerce and Energy Committee, Mr. Markey, and I am troubled. Uh, I am troubled by the fact that his conclusion in that report uh, had draws some very concerning points. He says that after reviewing all of the records that he asked for, voting records, reports, emails, correspondence, memoranda, phone or meeting minutes or other materials related to the events of Fukushima or the NRC's response to it, uh, he says that four NRC commissioners attempted to delay or otherwise impede the creation of the NRC near-term task force on Fukushima. He says that four NRC commissioners conspired with each other and with senior NRC staff to delay the release of and alter the NRC near-term task force report on Fukushima. He says that the other NRC commissioners attempted to slow down or otherwise impede the adoption of the safety recommendations made by the NRC near-term task force on Fukushima. He says that NRC Chairman Greg Yasko kept the other four NRC commissioners fully informed regarding the Japanese emergency despite claims to the contrary made by these commissioners. He said that a review of emails and other documents indicates high levels of suspicion and hostility directed at the chairman. And he said the consideration of the Fukushima safety upgrades is not the only safety-related issue that the other NRC commissioners have opposed. That concerns me. It concerns me when four members have findings like this by another uh, member on his committee with his staff. 
uh, and we come in here and sort of bear up on one. It seems we've got a problem with everybody here. Uh, you know, people have to work together in some respect. It is unprecedented that a commission would send a letter to the White House Chief of Staff. I'm not sure it's a good precedent to set, as opposed to trying to work things out. Mr. Chairman, do, do any of those six items that I just read, do, do they seem to you to be accurate? Well, it, it has been challenging, I think, to, to move forward on some of the task force recommendations. And uh, again, I, I wouldn't want to assign motives or any uh, other uh, ill intention to, to my colleagues. Uh, but I think we have had some, some challenges. Uh, Did you feel that, the things, that there was an attempt to slow down the release of that report on Fukushima? Uh, there was uh, definitely an attempt to, to prevent the release of the report. So do you think way. there was an attempt to make things more transparent and to provide to the public and Congress information that was important for them to have? There was certainly a disagreement on the Commission about providing it uh, transparently to the public. Uh, in the end, the, 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 the majority commission, uh, of the Commission uh, wound up uh, providing the report, but there was uh, a lot of internal disagreement about that on the Commission. I yield to the Chairman. Uh, now your time. Time has expired. You didn't give me any, and, and, I, and I understand how important your questioning was. With that, we go to the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Langford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Bill, thanks for being here. And uh, as others have mentioned before, and Mr. Cummings, th th this is a tough spot to be able to come to, to be able to talk about trying to work out functioning conversations, because we have a tough time with it in Congress ourselves. The issue still remains, though, the day-to-day -day operation of nuclear safety. And the decisions that you make are significant in this. And I want you to know, we appreciate the work that you do from day to day, keeping us safe. But this has got to be worked out, as you know well. And it is um, uh, an unprecedented action to say, this could affect safety long term if we don't work this out. And so thanks for coming forward on it. Thanks for working together, and let's try to resolve this. Uh, with that, Mr. Magwood, let me, let me ask you a question. You made a statement that safety is the top concern. T tell me your, your nuclear background, uh, just a, a brief statement. I have your bio, but make a brief, brief statement about your nuclear background. Well, mo most of my nuclear background is in government. I, um, I worked at the Department of Energy for 11 years as a political appointee. Um, I was in charge of uh, the nuclear infrastructure associated with the Civilian Nuclear Technology Program, uh, which include uh, the Idaho National Laboratory um, and, I guess, 2,500-odd contractors. Um, I was responsible for overseeing um, the, the management of reactor operations. Okay. In, in any of those operations, any of those environments, I assume you have got very competent people around you uh, that are all well studied, all well researched and do have disagreements on things. Has something like this occurred in other groups that you have worked with and other places to say we have four or five colleagues, we disagree, and it breaks out in something like this? So have you seen something like this in the past? No, I have not seen that. See, my, my concern is this is not just a disagreement among colleagues that are all competent on the issue. My concern is this becomes a management conversation to say how are things led by one individual or another, and how do we come to conclusions? Because uh, Mr. Jasko, I, I appreciate your statement saying you are passionate about safety and that all of these arguments and these disagreements and lack of communication breaks down to the fact that you are passionate about safety, but that definitely alludes to the fact that you are more passionate about safety than everyone else is, and so it just becomes more heated to you or more significant. And my concern is, uh, is there an impression in your mind that you are more competent and more passionate about safety than the other commissioners? Well, uh, Congressman, I, um, I, uh, I committed. Uh, are you more competent and more passionate about safety in these areas than the other commissioners? Uh, that's certainly not a judgment that I, I would make, and uh, uh, but I am passionate about safety, and that's uh, part uh, of what uh, I am. More, more so than the others around you. So there's five of you, and you look at you know the meetings that you're in. And you look at and you say, well, they're not. They're a little more. You know, they lean other directions besides safety. But I am more passionate about safety. Is that your concern? I, I um, uh, would leave it to others to judge uh, the various I'm, I'm asking uh, your I am asking your opinion because it affects your management style. I uh, treat all of my colleagues uh, as equal uh, members. And have Do equal you position. consider yourself more passionate about safety than your colleagues, yes or no? Uh, I uh, I'm not sure how I would describe more or less passionate, but I am, I am passionate about safety, and I, and I think that's the best I can tell you. That's a nice, safe answer. 
I am just asking a direct question, because it affects the, the, the reason I say that is, is because if in the back of your mind you are thinking, if this is really going to be done right, I am going to have to do it, because they are not as passionate as I am. Because I am trying to figure out why some people get some information and some people don't, and why recommendations come from staff and it gets filtered through to try to determine what gets out to different people. Because if you have in the back of your mind, I am concerned for our nuclear safety, so I need to make sure I filter what gets to them, because it may not be right. I just wanted to know, because that does affect your, your own record. So yes or no, are you more passionate about safety than others, or do you have a concern that some other commissioner is not as passionate about safety as you are? Well, I, in, in, in regard to the information coming to the Commission, and I think if that is the, uh, the basis for your question, uh, the Commission gets policy matters that come to the Commission for voting. Uh, information is provided as part of those. and I. I am rarely, if ever, involved in, in the provision of that information. Let, let, me, let me ask a quick question separate from that, and that is also a concern. There is a statement that has been made that you reportedly at one, at one moment said to the, about the two different other Democrat appointees that we Democrats have to stick together on a vote. Was that a statement that you made? I, I don't recall making that statement. Okay. My time is expired. Uh, would the gentleman yield? Yes, I would. Uh, do you have sourcing for that, uh, that statement? Well, my time has expired on that one. I would be glad to be able to take other Okay. If you would provide it, I uh, would appreciate it. Uh, Chairman, a piece of administrative business for a moment. Uh, the gentleman from Ohio was asked to have an uh, individual member's report from uh, Ed Markey placed in the record. I have no objections. I do have a request that goes with it. In reviewing it, uh, you delivered to an individual member, to uh, Ed Markey, your, one of your former uh, employers, you delivered him unredacted information and additional information beyond what this committee received through our request. Would you pledge today to deliver us in the same unredacted form everything, I repeat, everything that was responsive to uh, Mr. Markey? Uh, absolutely. And, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think, as you know, we have provided a large number of uh, documents to you. I appreciate that, but discovering that he received documents less redacted than we did as an individual member uh, and produced a report, I have no problem with this being placed in the record. But uh, in order to make the record complete, we would need to have the same information, which we do not have today. And quite frankly, we expect normally that uh, what is redacted is redacted for good and proper reasons, and there should be no difference whatsoever unless, in fact, a committee demands unredaction, not an individual member. So uh, if you agree to that, I withdraw my reserve, and we now recognize I, I, I want to thank the Chair for uh, including that in the record, and I, I agree with him that we should be able to receive this additional information. I think members on both sides would like to see it. Yes, Chairman. Uh, I, I would just note that I can, I can only speak for the documents that were in my possession. Uh, some of those other documents may have been provided by other members of the Commission. So uh, I uh, am certainly not aware of any documents that were redacted any differently. Uh, but, again, I can only speak sure. for those which well, are and, and the good news is that one thing I know about the executive branch is you guys authenticate very carefully what you give to people. So I am sure we won't have a problem getting the same information. And sometimes people interpret what somebody wants differently than somebody else. In this case, we want everything that Mr. Markey wanted for the same reason of doing our job. Uh, with that, we recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, I want to say um, it is uh, quite a spectacle to have five members of the Commission arguing about management style before a Committee of Congress. That in and of itself in some ways erodes confidence in the function of the Commission. One does not know who did what to whom and how important it is. The suggestion, obviously, by having a hearing of such prominence is has the potential effect of undermining that confidence, and obviously the chairman of the commission is the target. Um, I regret that because I think we are at risk, perhaps, of trivializing your mission. The real conversation that ought to be taking place here may be less about management style, though that can be important, and more about mission and how well or poorly 
historically the NRC has carried out that mission, its cozy relationship with industry, its ability to uh, cogently take lessons learned from tragedies such as Fukushima, its ability to reassure the public of safety and safety standards at nuclear power plants, and its ability to show demonstrably clear independence from the industry it regulates. It is just as viable to posit that what is going on here is that we have a chairman who takes the mission seriously as it is to say we have a chairman who bullies his fellow commissioners and employees. I don't know what the truth is, but I do think this hearing ought to try to get at it. Chairman Jasko, do you see a philosophical difference between yourself and your fellow commissioners with respect to the mission of NRC and how to go about it? Well, but we do have uh, different uh, approaches to what we believe is safe and how we define safety. And I think that is uh, clear in the different votes that we cast uh, and the positions that we take as commissioners. Well, specifically hone in on Fukushima. You, test, you, you answered a question about Fukushima just a little while ago to one of my colleagues, and you confirmed that, in fact, there was an attempt by your four fellow commissioners to uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, bury some of the findings of that study and or to aggressively look at lessons learned from the single worst nuclear disaster in world history? Uh, we did have a, uh, uh, a disagreement uh, you did. On, the, on the release of— You did. Uh, Is that what you said? That is correct. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, about the, the release of, of the report and whether or not uh, it should be reviewed by the Commission uh, prior to ever being released publicly. W what was the nature of that dispute? Well, it, w it was simply that I, I believe the report, once it was completed, should be made uh, publicly available, and, and uh, so the public could see what the views of uh, your commissioners uh, disagreed with that. Uh, there were some who did disagree and uh, wanted the report to be reviewed uh, uh, and perhaps acted on by the commission and changed before it was released publicly. Um, on August twenty third, we had a major earthquake here in the East Coast, surprised everybody, including in my home state of Virginia. Um, we had a close call at the North Anna nuclear power plant as a result of that earthquake, which did generally cosmetic, some minor structural damage up and down the East Coast. But it was a reminder that nuclear power can be vulnerable to seismic activity. Um, that plant was deemed as exceeding its design basis. Could you explain what that means to us, Chairman Jasko, and what was the nature of the concern at the time after the August 23rd earthquake? Well, when, uh, when plants are originally built and, and designed, they, uh, they pick out the characteristics of an earthquake, uh, and they build all of the structures uh, in the plant to be able to withstand that type of uh, an event. And the earthquake, in fact, was bigger than the earthquake that was um, uh, hypothesized in the original design of the facility. So there was some shaking of the buildings that was uh, larger than what, what was originally uh, in, the, in the original analysis for the, for the plant. Potentially compromising safety? Uh, certainly uh, it had the potential to compromise safety. Were there other nuclear power plants in the East Coast that were similarly affected or could have been? Uh, we didn't see any that were um, directly uh, it, it is impacted because that plant was very close to the center of the earthquake. But it was certainly possible that uh, uh, other plants could have experienced effects from the earthquake. Post-August 23rd earthquake, what action did the NRC take, and was the Commission in agreement or also in disagreement about those actions? The, um, uh, the Commission uh, or the agency really uh, reviewed the safety of, uh, of the facility. Ultimately, it was a staff decision uh, to determine whether or not the facility should restart. Uh, and uh, I was very clear with the staff that they needed to do what they felt was appropriate for, um, for safety. Uh, and in fact, the Commission uh, held a, an information briefing uh, because there was interest among my colleagues in hearing and understanding what we were, uh, what we were doing. And I think it was a very uh, productive meeting and a very uh, a strong show, I think, of, of the Commission working and functioning as a body. Consensually? Uh, yes. Um, my time has expired. I hope we get a chance to explore that some more. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. I will now uh, recognize myself for, for uh, five minutes' question. I am going to ask the non-chairman commissioners a series of 
what I hope are quick questions and expectation, hopefully, of an equally quick answer. Uh, Ms. Uh, Spinnecke, uh, is the Chairman's behavior uh, affecting your ability to discharge the duties uh, for which you uh, took an oath to discharge? To this point, I believe that I have uh, had access to what I need to faithfully execute my duties. However, I am concerned that we are at the point where that is being compromised. Have you lost confidence in his ability to lead? Uh, yes, on the basis of his interpersonal conduct, I have. Commissioner Magwood, same two questions to you. Do you believe his behavior is impacting your ability to do your job, and have you lost confidence in his ability to lead? It's a very complicated question. It's hard to answer with yes and no. Let me let me answer it this way. I think that I, I'm sorry. I, I think that the um, you know over the time that I've been a commissioner, um, I've been able to get information that I that gives me enough confidence to make votes and to make decisions. Um, there have been times when getting the information has been more difficult uh, than I think it should have been. Um, my biggest concern is there all, there are always is the the chance that there is some piece of information I just didn't even know existed that never got to me. Um, so as far as I know, I have had the ability to make decisions fully informed. Um, I have questions, I have doubts, and I have concerns. Uh, Commissioner Ostendorf. My concerns with respect to uh, the Chairman's style have been primarily that his uh, interface with our NRC staff has been abrasive. He uses the term passionate. I would say it has prevented staff from feeling comfortable they can bring forth their best views and recommendations to the Commission. From that standpoint, I think that is a grave concern. Have you lost confidence in his ability to lead? At this stage, I have, yes. Uh, Commissioner Ospitalakis. So far, my votes have been have not been affected adversely by any actions by the chairman. Uh, in fact, in the letter to the chief of staff, we, we said that there may uh, there may be some harm in the future if this continues. I believe if the chairman lets the staff send us their true. Uh, views when various issues come before the Commission, and if he also controls his temper a little bit, he can continue to lead the Commission. Uh, Chairman, there was a, an apology issued. I don't know whether you drafted it or the White House drafted it. Who drafted your apology? Uh, I prepared a letter that uh, I sent to Mr. Daly. I'm not sure if that's the letter you're referring to. Have you apologized more than once? Uh, I have indicated to uh, to Mr. Daly in, in that letter that I was sorry for the distraction that this has caused. And is that the only thing you're sorry for? Is the distraction? Do you admit any of the conduct that's been alleged this morning? If uh, again, many of these uh, uh, accusations uh, I'm hearing for the first time. Uh, well, that, that 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 doesn't impact whether they're true or not. The fact that you haven't heard them yet doesn't mean they're not true. My question is simple: Are they true? Uh, I don't believe that they are true. Uh, what does that mean, I don't believe that they are true? Have you been verbally abusive to female staff? No, I have not. Have you withheld information from your fellow commissioner? I have not. Have you asked anyone, are they on your team? Uh, I have never said something like that. Chairman, let me tell you what it looks like from my vantage point, which my background is not in nuclear science. Uh, when you have four eyewitnesses that testify to something under oath, you know what they call the defendant after that? An inmate. Four eyewitnesses to the conduct. It is unprecedented to me to have colleagues criticize one another privately. To do it publicly and to have to sit on either side of you to do it before a committee of Congress, to me, is unprecedented. None of the allegations they have made are accurate. Is that your testimony? I, I believe that uh, many of these uh, instances that they are referring to have been misconstrued. And, uh, and as I have indicated, that there are uh, issues where I think we can improve our communication. So what did you apologize for? Uh, 
I apologize, as, as I indicated, for, for their misunderstanding. Cause. Did you apologize because they misunderstood what you did? Uh, I have uh, offered to uh, my colleagues that we sit down with a, uh, a third party, uh, someone that we all could agree on to We really talk need about a, these a counselor for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission? Uh, we need a counselor for that? I am very interested in improving the communication because I think it is Does vital it matter to you that the four of them either have or are rapidly losing confidence in your leadership? Does that matter to you? That is very important to me. And it is something that I am very interested in working on. Would you deny the allegations that they tested FIDE to under oath? Congressman, I, I believe I have answered this question. Uh, we will do it again for me. Do you deny them? I, as I said, I believe I have answered this question very, very well to the best of my ability here. I would recognize the gentleman from, from Illinois, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I would like to yield 30 seconds to my colleague from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. Uh, with all due respect to my good friend uh, at the, in the chair, uh, these uh, allegations are not allegations of uh, criminal misconduct or anything like that. They are allegations that uh, he doesn't get along with his commissioners. Uh, that is not a basis for uh, either uh, imprisonment or for uh, having uh, the chairman resign. So I think that we have to put this in perspective and continue to insist that the commission focus on safety. And I want to take this opportunity to wish all of the uh, members of the commission a happy new year. Claiming my time. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me first of all thank the witnesses for appearing. I am going to shift gears a little bit. In July, the Union of Concerned Scientists issued a report titled U.S. Nuclear Power After Fukushima, Common Sense Recommendations for Safety and Security. This report includes recommendations for changes the NRC should make to improve the safety and security of U.S. nuclear plants. One recommendation made by UCS was that NRC regulations should be extended to cover severe accidents. This is what the UCS report says. The NRC defines severe accidents as those more serious than the so-called design basis accidents that U.S. reactors are designed to withstand. While unlikely severe accidents can occur, as in Fukushima, and cause substantial damage to the reactor core and failure of the containment building, leading to large releases of radiation. For example, the agency does not evaluate or test the severe accident management guidelines that reactor owners have voluntarily developed. So neither the NRC nor the public can be confident these guidelines would be affected. Mr. Chairman, I understand that there has to be a reasonable limit on what licenses are required to do and that every plant can't be fully prepared for every imaginable worst-case scenario. However, Fukushima should provide a wake-up call that severe accidents can and do happen. The Gulf oil spill is a prime example. That was the worst case scenario. Industry wasn't prepared, and it resulted in the worst environmental disaster in our Nation's history. Would you would agree with that statement? Yes, it is a very uh, Would the gentleman suspend for just a moment? Uh, we we'll stop the clock. We are going to have a minority hearing in a few moments, because that is a right. And I want to make sure that everyone understands I have been very tolerant, but this hearing is not on nuclear safety, and we are not a committee with nuclear safety as a direct oversight. This is on the leadership of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and although I will allow anything you want to do with your five minutes, I have always been very understanding. I would caution all members on both sides of the aisle that this is about a concern that has been legitimately raised all the way to the White House, that the committee believes is well within our unique jurisdiction as the Oversight Committee. We are not the Energy and Commerce Committee. We are not some of the Science Committee and so on. So uh, I've, I just the gentleman can continue. The chairman can answer. 
But if we are going to make this about nuclear safety, then we have essentially hijacked a legitimate issue, and anyone who does it, shame on you. Mr. Chairman, uh, just, just, ranking member? just clarification. I, I, just, I didn't hear the question that the uh, gentleman asked, but part of this hearing goes to uh, safety and whether the, this commission uh, can function and carry out its safety uh, responsibilities. As a matter of fact, there has been uh, the, the, the majority report that came out talked about a c catastrophe. And I use that word because it is what was said at the Commission and that they would not be able to function properly. So I don't know whether that question goes to safety and whether or not they are able to carry well, out the their gentleman yield up, uh, and, and I thank the Ranking Member. Uh, I was cautioning members because uh, Mr. Davis uh, probably was the best example of I know he was well-intentioned, but nothing in his comment and nothing in his question seemed to go to the management and the questions of the management would capability the, to manage. The chairman the, but hold on. The, the fact is I respect every member of this committee. I have always said, and, and I wasn't that way when we were in the minority uh, in a couple of cases. Mr. McHenry vividly remembers being shut up because he was, quote, off subject. Use your five minutes any way you want, but I would caution members that, in fact, our jurisdiction, our legitimate jurisdiction, is not over directly second-guessing safety, but, in fact, our oversight of the entire Federal workforce, all commissions, all agencies. And so uh, I only would ask that we do as much as we can to recognize that if, if there is an additional hearing and if we legitimately can hold a hearing on the safety of our nuclear facilities more broadly, that is a legitimate hearing to ask for. This hearing was very narrow and it had to do exactly with why these five commissioners are here today. The ranking uh, uh, member. Just, just, briefly, there, uh, just briefly, there are two points I want to make briefly. First of all, thank you for holding this hearing. I think it is important at this time and place that we have the hearing. And the second thing that relates to Mr. Davis's concerns, if, for example, the, the industry is upset with this chairman and they would go through the members of the commission to try to uh, get it to chairman, the industry might be upset because they are concerned of pressure on safety. This is just a hypothetical. No. So I think that there might be a connection here. And, and Mr. Kucinich, I completely agree with you might that if, if, in fact, the line of questioning goes toward, quite frankly, the intent and the reason behind uh, two Democratic and two Republican appointees uh, somehow making an objection that is not based on the failure of, of or the allegation of mismanagement or particularly of outburst and erratic behavior, you are absolutely right. Those kinds of questions certainly fall within the question of management at Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, and would be in order. Uh, and, Mr. Davis, I apologize uh, if you want to take additional time to restate thank your Mr. question. Chairman, I want to thank you for the manner in which you have conducted this hearing. I appreciate it, and I am uh, very grateful. Thank you. Mr. Davis. It is difficult for me to understand in any way, shape, form, or fashion, and quite frankly, we haven't gotten to my question yet. <laughs> it is coming in a second. My, I, it, the mission of the regulatory agency is very important to me, the mission and the outcomes of the decisions that are made. No matter how much you may disagree or bicker, I have difficulty with management style and with personality differences. In the end, the bottom line is do we make the best and most effective decisions for the people of this country and other environments that are impacted and affected by those decisions? And so, Mr. Chairman, my question is, do you feel that the, 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 the interaction between yourself and other commissioners have had any negative impact relative to decisions that the Commission has made? Well, no, I, I don't think it has. I think um, uh, certainly I want to work to improve the communication. But, uh, for example, 
Uh, since uh, this letter uh, was worked on, uh, the Commission has held nine meetings uh, where we have gotten together uh, and, and been briefed on a variety of different issues. We have held uh, one of our significant uh, hearings related to new reactor licensing. Uh, we have held um, three of our formal voting type sessions where we, uh, we formalize legal opinions of the Commission. Uh, and as I said uh, yesterday, we, um, we held a meeting on a very important safety issue related to fire protection. Uh, the Commission has also uh, held uh, at least two uh, agenda sessions, which I have held routinely uh, every month, and that was in particular one of the uh, suggestions and recommendations from that 1999 Inspector General report, that the Commission have regular sessions to talk about agenda, and that is something I have instituted. So your answer is no. Let me just, Mr. Chairman, with your indulgence, could I ask if the other Commissioners would just respond? Quickly to, to that. I'd ask for unanimous consent for an additional 30 seconds for the gentleman. Without objection, continue. The decisions have not been affected by the management uh, issues that we have raised. I believe all the decisions have been made having in mind the safety uh, and the adequate protection of the American public. And I am personally very offended by the suggestion that I am an instrument of the industry in its efforts to overthrow the chairman. I agree with Commissioner Postolakis. I am also offended by, by the implication of Mr. Kucinich's statement. I assure this committee. I want to respond. Uh, please continue, sir. With respect to uh, Mr. Davis's uh, statement, I cannot more wholeheartedly agree with your emphasis on nuclear safety. I agree with my colleague, Commissioner Postolakis, that we have done our very best and we are making good decisions. That said, we are still operating under a very difficult environment that does not give me confidence that our staff feels free to bring us the best information uninfluenced. Thank you. Yes. Point of personal privilege. Uh, the, the, the gentleman is suspended. Continue. Uh, you, the gentleman is trying to get answers from no, each of the commissions, yeah, and I would like to have that in order first. Um, I agree with my colleagues. I think that we have been able to continue the, uh, the people's business um, very, um, very well in the circumstances. Um, I think the senior staff has managed to keep the agency focused um, during whatever uh, conflicts have been occurring. Uh, the staff of the NRC has been focused on their mission and safety. Um, I believe that the agency is functioning um, at the bottom line, protecting health and safety as well as it ever has, uh, that doesn't mean it's been easy. Thank you. Yes. I agree with Commissioner Magwood's response. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate it. Uh, would you yield to the gentleman from Ohio for yes. a few seconds? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Ostendorf, if I didn't call your name, I gave a hypothetical about the potential influence of the industry on members of the Commission. But since you objected to that, I find that very instructive. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. I yield back. Thank, I thank the gentleman. We now go to the, uh, the gentleman from Michigan. One second. Oh, I'm sorry. I now go to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Ross. Thank you. Uh, the, the Republican so on the Democratic side, <laughs> Mr. Ross. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Magwood, uh, I'm very impressed with your experience not only in the nuclear industry but also as an administrator. Uh, and I read your testimony, uh, opening testimony, and you talk about some incidents involving uh, some abusive behavior with female employees that you had encountered. In, in fact, I think you ind indicated that, uh, nevertheless, um, I found their misogynistic behavior entirely unacceptable and personally offensive, and you immediately let these, the, the, these supervisors go. Um, that behavior that those people that you let go. Does that compare in any way to the behavior uh, expressed by Chairman Yasko? Uh, it, was, it was similar in the fact that it was, it was verbal abuse. Um, it was involved screaming and, and you know, just a lot of pointed language uh, that the women involved found very, very uh, emotionally straining. And when you let go in your previous situation, when you let those supervisors go that were being the abusers, uh, that changed, didn't it? It improved the situation? 
Well, let me, let me, let me emphasize, I, I, it was within the federal government, so I didn't really have the ability to simply fire these people. I, I would have liked to have fired them. But you eliminated the, the, but the Absolutely. I, the I, took, I immediately, the very day I found out, I, they were removed from their supervisor responsibilities and geographically relocated. And do you believe that removing Chairman Yasko may uh, be able to be appropriate to protect any further abuse uh, to, to female members of the NRC? I, I, I suspect that a question like that might come up. I have decided just to simply present the facts as I understand them um, and let others make that decision. It is not within my power to, um, to appoint or, or remove a chairman. But I think that these are, this is information that uh, people But it rose to the level of abuse that you had seen in the past. Uh, there, it was very similar. The stories I heard were very similar to what I heard in the past. And removing that abuse corrected the problem? Yes, it did. Okay. And that has been your experience. Ms. Savinsky, um, you talked about a lack of confidence. Do you feel there is any way to repair the confidence in this chairman? Um, I, I, if the conduct were to be um, completely changed, uh, there is always the potential to rehabilitate relationships. Uh, Commissioner Ostendorf, how do you feel? Do you feel that, that your lack of confidence at this point is, is reparable, or do you feel that, that it is just lost? I have to agree. Sorry. I have to agree with Commissioner Svenicky that uh, it has been severely damaged, and once uh, there is an erosion of trust, it is extraordinarily difficult to regain that trust. I am not going to say it is going to be impossible or would be impossible, but it would be extraordinarily difficult to regain. Thank you. And, Chairman, I, I, I can't help but sit here and think back as a kid watching the movie uh, The Cane Mutiny with Humphrey Bogart and uh, him being put on trial and, and, and by his crew members uh, in a very situ serious situation. So, I, I mean, it begs the question, Captain, I mean, Chairman Yasko, how has the, uh, the, the voyage been so far? Um, we are at a point now where you have made an apology. And, and specifically what I am asking is what did you apologize for? Well, as I've indicated uh, in a letter to uh, to Mr. Daly, I uh, apologize for the distraction, and uh, and I look forward to uh, discussions with my colleagues about ways that we can uh, further enhance and improve our communication and and trust. And one of those suggestions is that you have a, a third party, I would assume, a facilitator, to try to reopen lines of communications with your your, your fellow commissioners. My concern is is that if the issue becomes more of maintaining your position as opposed to restoring the integrity of the NRC, what is your course of action? Are you considering a resignation? Uh, I have no plans to resign. Okay. Even if it means more to focus on keeping your job than to restoring the NRC? Uh, I have no plans to resign because I, uh, I continue to believe that uh, under my leadership the agency has performed very well. We have committed our, ourselves to safety, and, uh, and I believe my record shows that. But it is unprecedented where we are today, when you have the, the four commissioners who have made these allegations. And, and, and as a student of management myself, I can only suggest to you that management by intimidation may have some short-term goals, but some long-term effects that are very adverse. Management by motivation is probably the only way you can restore the integrity of this organization. And so I implore you, I beg of you, if it is your position you seek to keep, then it is the integrity of this organization that must be foremost. And it must be done so through not only a facilitator, if that is what you believe, but more importantly through motivating these people to be the best that they have been, been able to be. Uh, for what is at stake here is not only the 4,000 employees, but the nuclear safety of this entire country. I yield back. Would the gentleman yield? I yield. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Chairman, wouldn't you agree that what is going on here today and what has been going on for months now clearly hurts your ability to retain, recruit, retain many of those 4,000 people and to motivate them to do their best job? Well, I, uh, I have uh, not seen any drop off in any of those areas. Okay. So none of this has any effect on 4,000 people? I, as I indicated, I think it is unfortunate that we have this distraction, but uh, the men and women at the NRC are professionals and uh, they will continue to do their jobs effectively. Um, okay. Uh, we now go to the gentleman, Mr. Welsh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for calling the hearing. Uh, a couple of points. Uh, number one, uh, I uh, uh, regret, obviously, that we are here. Uh, this is not a personnel committee, and it is regrettable that there is this conflict at the senior level of uh, the commissioners. Uh, number two, I don't think that Congress is the place to go to resolve this. Uh, number three, uh, I assume that each one of the members uh, of the Commission 
uh, is professional. It makes decisions based on each of your own independent best judgment. Uh, the obstacles uh, and the challenges that you face, uh, professional and personal, uh, notwithstanding. Uh, and I think we all owe you uh, that uh, debt of, uh, of gratitude. The concerns I have are less about trying to resolve something that I don't believe is within the capacity of a congressional committee to resolve. It has to do with uh, the safety and the focus on safety. And I say that as a representative from the State of Vermont where we have had an ongoing and somewhat contentious uh, situation involving our local nuclear reactor. Uh, when things like a cooling tower fall down uh, and the reaction on the part of uh, the company that runs it is that it is not really a big deal, uh, that doesn't provide great assurance to the people of Vermont. Uh, when there is discovered leaking underground uh, reactive material uh, in the response of the, uh, uh, the, the nuclear uh, power company is that they don't have underground pipes and it turns out, in fact, they do have underground pipes. Uh, that causes significant concern, uh, concern about Vermonters. Uh, there is litigation now, and we understand that uh, this body uh, voted on a, between the State of Vermont uh, and Entergy about its future. And we understand that the uh, Commission voted by a 3 to 2 margin uh, to come in as a friend. Uh, on the side of energy against this uh, litigation. Uh, that causes us con some concern. So safety is my concern, and I know that safety is your concern, but I just have a few questions. The most in our, it, it caused me some concern about how active and aggressive the Commission is on coming to a conclusion about some safety standards. The most recent NRC fire protection standards were promulgated in, in 2004. Uh, earlier standards that applied had not been met for 25 years. And as I understand it, currently 47 nuclear power plants are still not in compliance, and they are requesting yet another 12-year delay. And my understanding is the Commission is basically accommodating a 12-year delay on top of a 25-year delay. Uh, 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 Commissioner Apostolakis, I hope I pronounced your name right, could you address that? Uh, yes. Uh the uh, the reason why the uh, the new regulation was promulgated in the 2000s is that because of the large number of exemptions that uh, requests for exemptions that we received regarding the earlier uh, rule, we decided or the staff decided that uh, this was not working very well. But I would like to point out when we say 47 plants or units do not comply. They have been, they have implemented compensatory measures. They don't comply with some provisions of the original rule, but they have done something else to meet the intent of the rule. Okay. So it is not that they are unsafe or anything. And this new rule now. Well, yes, I'm sorry. Thank you. I, I only have a few minutes, but I appreciate your response. Thank but you. I, I guess what I will have to do, because I can't really ask a lot of questions is expressed to each of you the concern we have about what appears to be a very slow turnaround on the implementation of safety standards. And you know full well that if you are living in the shadow of a nuclear plant, the closer you are, the more anxious you are. But we have examples, and this is what is so profoundly important about the safety focus, is that if something can go wrong, even when we think it won't, it probably at some point will go wrong, and that is what we saw in Japan. And if something goes wrong, the consequences of an event are so catastrophic, and I am pe preaching to the choir here, I know, but I am doing it because this is the anxiety that uh, we live with in Vermont. And when we have a nuclear power plant where the, water co uh, the cooling tower collapses and we are told not to worry about it, <laughs> that is that's <laughs> It is hard to be comfortable. And when there is leaking pipes and we are told there are no pipes, and upon investigation there is, we really need to see a sense of urgency uh, and, in some cases, uh, uh, some penalties associated with 
uh, wrong information being provided and failure to comply with safety standards. Because some of these things that happen in the beginning that fortunately don't cause harm give you some apprehension that an event will occur that does cause harm. So thank you very much. Thank you. We now go to the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Wahlberg, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to uh, the panel for being here. Uh, this, is, this is truly not a uh, hearing that I ever expected to be a part of uh, as a member of Congress, uh, and certainly not with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Uh, but I think it is a, a hearing that uh, apparently is very well positioned and important to have. Uh, when I read through the uh, letter that was sent to uh, Chief of Staff Daley, and I read uh, bullet points uh, in that letter, uh, and I would like uh, any commissioners that would be willing to comment uh, to a question I will have from this, uh, where it says that uh, the chairman intimidated and bullied senior career staff, uh, that he interacted with us, his fellow commissioners, with such intemperance and disrespect that the Commission no longer functions as effectively as it should. Uh, that strong language in a letter an unprecedented letter that has been sent uh, to uh, this administration. Uh, and I would, I would surmise that if uh, this administration um, from this hearing understands the gravity of this situation and how that, with no pun intended, this could blow up still further uh, to a regulatory agency of uh, an amazing importance to us. Uh, that strong language is, is uh, telling. Um, can you, any, any of the commissioners, uh, explain to me why this language was included with specific illustrations? I don't want to pick, pick on a University of Michigan uh, grad, but uh, Commissioner Svinke, uh, why was the language included, and, and what are some of the key illustrations that you would give for its importance? I um, would state that uh, I realize the significance of putting my hand to that language. I did not do so lightly. I would characterize that I did it uh, very reluctantly candid and, and candidly, I would state, realizing that ultimately it could bring us to the kind of um, event that we are holding this morning. And I regret that, but um, that language at that time, I supported that. I was comfortable and in support of it, but realized the significance of my action. Any significant illustrations uh, of, of, of what you put in that language, examples? It, I think a number of the events have already been testified to this morning regarding interactions uh, between the chairman and the st professional staff of the agency. Um, there also have been very tense uh, interactions and meetings between the chairman and the members, uh, other members of the commission. Um, and again, I, I think people can be passionate about issues uh, without uh, fundamentally the kind of conduct uh, that I have uh, observed. Any other commissioners' response to that? Yes, sir. I will comment uh, specifically that senior staff has complained to me personally about the chairman taking an approach that uh, led them to believe that they were not in a free environment to bring forth their best views with respect to uh, how SECI paper 110093, the near-term task force report from Japan, where there is a paper that was acknowledged to have been withdrawn back in July. There is also staff complained to me about um, how the chairman's office and chairman responded to their uh, content of the 21-day report with respect to the short-term actions to be taken as a result of Fukushima. So this goes to safety. Those two reports dealt with uh, how the Commission would take actions in response to the Fukushima event. Okay. Any other Commissioner response to that? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I want to yield to you uh, some time, but I do have one final question. So I would be glad to yield at this if you will then allow me to finish uh, with one. I will I'll be, I'll be very brief. For each of the commissioners, do you believe that employees, professional staff of the uh, NRC have experienced intimidation, 
hostile or offensive conduct on behalf of the chair by the chairman anything that would be considered to be intimidating hostile or offensive by the chairman any professional staff experience that yes 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 ladies and gentlemen that's the definition of harassment i hope that we can all agree that that's why we put it into statute i yield back thank you mr chairman uh, Recently, Dale Klein, a former commissioner and colleague, suggested that uh, the chairman does not need to be removed from the panel, but could instead be demoted by the president, and a new chairman be chosen from among the existing members. Uh, would anyone on the panel like to comment on this potential solution? I don't think you are going to get someone that wants to be, say they want to be chairman here today. <laughs> I ask unanimous consent the gentleman have an additional 30 seconds. Well, I, I guess that is my point, uh, Mr. Chairman. I probably didn't expect someone to answer and say, yeah, I would like to be the chairman, or I will appoint that, I will suggest someone. But I think this certainly indicates a very significant problem with this Commission being able to function together for the best interests of this country, the citizens it serves the regulatory responsibility they have, and that, indeed, if this is the problem, to this extent, and the administration is willing to let it go on, we in America have concerns beyond simple management styles. But the function of this regulatory agency and the responsibility to the, to the American people. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman? I, I thank the gentleman. Uh, if the gentleman would like to respond. Could I, yeah, could I make a comment, please? I uh, appreciate the, uh, the opportunity. Uh, my colleague mentioned uh, a meeting or a phone conversation I had had on the development of the, the, the so-called 21-day paper. Uh, I believe the committee has an audio recording of that, um, of that conversation, uh, and I am certainly comfortable with that audio being uh, made publicly available. Uh, I believe it, um, it characterizes uh, my passion uh, and demonstrates my commitment to um, open uh, discussions among, uh, among members uh, of the staff and my strong interest in them providing me with their candid views uh, so that, if nothing else, I can ensure that the Commission is informed with the information it needs. I thank the gentleman. Uh, can I get a nodding of heads by all the commissioners that the release of audio that has been recorded can be made available to the committee? Hearing no objections, I will assume they will be delivered to us. With that, we recognize the gentleman from Idaho, Mr. Labrador, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I especially want to say, uh, welcome Mr. Magwood, Commissioner Magwood, uh, who worked uh, diligently at Idaho uh, National Laboratory. And I believe uh, Commissioner Svinicki worked for one of our Senators. So uh, thank you for being here. Um, th this has been truly one of the most frustrating hearings I have ever participated in, because I have never seen such self-deluded behavior by any individual in probably my entire life. Um, the lack of awareness of what is happening here in the Commission is, is truly astound, astound, astounding to me, uh, to watch an individual just sit here and say that the only thing he is responsible for and he is sorry about is the distraction that has been caused by your behavior is truly uh, just embarrassing just to watch you uh, this entire time that I have been here. So let's really just get down to, to what's happening here. You believe, and you did not answer this question when uh, my good colleague over here uh, asked you the question, but you believe that you are more passionate than the other four individuals uh, st sitting here about nuclear safety. Is that not true? Well, I, uh, I just answer the question, yes or no. You can say yes, you can say no. Are you more passionate or are you less passionate? Or are you equally passionate? It is a simple question. My, my voting record, I think, uh, shows that I have taken uh, positions on safety. So you are more passionate. Is that what you believe? I would say my, my position. And you also more. believe that you have better judgment than these four individuals. Is that not true? Uh, I believe that I have taken Yes or no? Simple question. 
I believe I have a very good judgment uh, as a safety And director. your judgment is better than the four individuals here combined. Isn't that true, according to your own opinion? Uh, it is up to others to determine. Uh, no, it is up to you, because you are the one who is making the decisions that is making their life a living hell. So you tell me, do you have more passion, do you have better judgment, yes or no? I feel very strongly that I have an appropriate uh, judgment. In, in so you have better AP. judgment than the other four individuals that are sitting here, correct? According to you. Uh, Congressman, as, as I said many times, I, I, I'm not Okay, you're not going to answer judgment. the question when it's clearly from your statements, from your actions, that you believe that your judgment and your passion surpasses the four of them combined. Um, so your distraction that is being caused, it is interesting to me. I have managed an organization. I had a law firm for a while. Now I have to manage my, law, my, my congressional office. Your management style is bringing some problems that are, that are being brought here to the fore. And you are saying that you are willing to work with them, but you are not willing to admit that you have done anything wrong. That is what I cannot understand. The only way you are going to be able to work with these individuals and actually change your management style is by admitting that you actually screwed up, that you actually did something wrong. Are you not willing to admit that there is something in your management style that has brought us to a congressional hearing that is unprecedented in American history? Well, uh, Congressman, uh, I take responsibility yes or no. for this uh, agency. Uh, and as I have indicated, I am willing to uh, discuss these issues with my colleagues and, and figure out how we can uh, better communicate. But you haven't done anything wrong. What are you going to discuss? That they are wrong and you are right, correct? Uh, I would like to discuss these uh, communication uh, issues and, and some of the misunderstandings. Have you that we done have. anything wrong uh, in your management of this agency? Uh, Congressman, uh, as I said, I take full responsibility for, for what? For this organization. And no, for what in your behavior are you taking responsibility for? Just name one thing, just one thing that you admit that you have done wrong, because I don't believe that these four individuals would come here if you haven't done a single thing wrong. Just name one thing that you have done wrong. Well, uh, Congressman, as I said, I uh, I'm very passionate about safety, uh, and uh, so it's wrong for you to be passionate about safety. Is that what you're telling the American people right now, Congressman? Uh, Is that wrong to be passionate about safety? And they're not passionate about safety, right? Uh, Congressman, as I said, I uh, I'm very passionate about safety, and uh, if that's ever been misconstrued by my colleagues, that's something I'd like so to. So, what in your passion, in your passionate statements, was wrong that would bring us to a moment? that we have to have these four individuals, these four commissioners who have dedicated their entire life to the public safety of our nation, what in your behavior is wrong? Just name one thing. That is all I am asking. I can name 20 things that I have done wrong in my life if somebody asks me the question. You can't name one thing. Well, Congressman, uh, as I indicated, it is a conversation I think uh, I would like to have with my colleagues to better understand their It is ridiculous. Uh, your answers today have been totally ridiculous, because there is no way that these individuals who have the same passion, the same commitment to the, new, to the safety of the United States would be sitting here complaining about you, complaining about the staff, unless you had done something wrong. And it is absolutely ridiculous for us to to think that under any circumstance you are going to change your behavior because you are not even willing to admit that you did one thing wrong. That is just incredulous to, to anybody who is watching this, this meeting. Mr. Chairman, I have run out of time. I thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from New Hampshire, Mr. Ginta, for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I just have a couple of quick questions. Uh, for anyone on the panel other than the chairman, can, can anybody talk to me about the first IG report and, and what conclusions it made relative to, to this issue? I, uh, sir, I will attempt uh, just broadly. I, the NRC Inspector General has testified, I believe, before the House Energy and Commerce mm -hmm. Committee earlier this year on the content and conclusions of his report. Uh, that report focused, um, it covered a number of issues, but it spent much of its content on the decision making around the um, Yucca Mountain related activities at NRC. Uh, there were um, some other more broad findings about the relationship on the Commission, and um, I would like to reacquaint myself with those findings but rather than testify okay. them generally. Um, to the, to the Chairman, I see a letter here dated December 12th uh, from uh, the President's Chief of Staff, and it is 
uh, issued to uh, Chairman Issa. And in it, it says, uh, the fourth paragraph down, he has indicated his intention to reach out to his fellow Commission colleagues for that purpose. He is referring to you. And uh, on the back of the letter, he talks about uh, the development of any recommendations to improve the circumstance. So it sounds like what he is saying here is that uh, the President is not going to take action, that he would prefer these issues be resolved by, uh, by you and the Commission. Is that your understanding of? Well, I, I don't want to, to, to speak for, uh, certainly for the Administration, but uh, as I read the letter, um, uh, what I saw was that the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Chief of Staff would be uh, looking at the situation and, uh, and would be looking to an Inspector General report to get some guidance on uh, ways to uh, improve uh, the, the organization. Would you agree with the assessment in this letter that the disagreements uh, amongst the Commission are over policy matters? Well, I certainly think we have uh, policy disagreements, uh, but I, I, there are also, I believe, organizational uh, uh, miscommunications and misunderstandings about roles and responsibilities. Well, it, it, to me, it appears that um, the, I, the, the IG's report has, has, has really not improved things. As a matter of fact, that from what I have read and, and heard, you can make an argument that things have further deteriorated. So I appreciate your um, interest in wanting to work with your colleagues, but it, it seems like that point has come and gone. Um, and, and as stated by other members of, of this committee, I think there is growing frustration that uh, we are at this level uh, of, of inquiry. So um, I, I would uh, prefer that this be handled in one of two ways, but uh, have you yourself, uh, you say you would take full responsibility for actions of the committee. Would you consider stepping down as chairman? Uh, I have no intention to resign. Okay. I would yield back the remainder of my time. Uh, General would yield. Thank you. Uh, I, I think it is clear the chairman is making no po apologies for misconduct, only for the lack of harmonious life among the five of you. Uh, the, uh, I asked the chairman who his board of directors is. Uh, I asked him about collaborative and, and normally consensus type activity. For each of the commissioners, uh, when the chairman was not the chairman, do any of you believe that he would have accepted one of you treating him the way he is now treating you? No. I, I believe I am the only member of the commission who served uh, with uh, Chair, Chairman Yatsko when he was then a commissioner. We were both commissioners when I began my service on the commission. And I would characterize that I actually, um, when I was new to the commission, found very helpful that he tutored me uh, in many of the ways of insisting upon the um, the role of individual commissioners, that they have an important contribution to make. So when he I was a commissioner, that I learned man, ma many of those points from him. So when he was a commissioner, life was collaborative. He got it. He was a former staffer to House and Senate people. He kind of got the idea that you all had to work together and reach uh, at least the three-two vote, and hopefully a four-one or a five-zero whenever possible. So this is a very capable commissioner, just not a good chairman, in your opinion, a terrible chairman, in your opinion. It, I would characterize that during that period uh, it really was limited to policy differences at times and not the differences we see now. Okay, I would ask unanimous consent for just 30 more seconds for a single question, because one half of it has been asked repeatedly. For each of the commissioners, now I am not looking at you as Republicans or Democrats, even Democratic members, because as far as I can tell, none of you are partisans in your background, certainly career Navy officers and so on. So. Uh, you have been accused, sort of, of being lapdogs for industry, not caring enough about safety. It has been some insinuation that that could be the case. Would each of you just briefly tell me about your view, your passion about safety and how that uh, brings you to each of your votes when you are given an opportunity? Please. Um, it, uh, my sole motivation in serving on the NRC is to work on issues of uh, advanced nuclear safety and security for the country. I have many family members in Wisconsin and Michigan that live near to nuclear power plants, and so uh, I am concerned for all Americans and think and, and am motivated even by my own family and, and, their, and their protection and safety. Commissioner Magwood. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as someone who has spent really my entire professional career working in, in, in the nuclear field, 
I, I have a, a very deep appreciation for the, um, for the hazards presented by handling of nuclear materials. Um, I have overseen it for many years at DOE. And as a result, I view any nuclear activity as a matter of great responsibility. And I think that anyone who is involved in that activity should be held to a very, very, very high standard. And I, I expect the best of everyone involved. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I have a record going back to 1976 of being involved in nuclear power issues, nuclear weapons issues. I assure you that having operated and trained others to operate, supervise, and maintain nuclear power plants on submarines, that I have a very rigid sense of safety and am very concerned on safety issues. And uh, I welcome anybody to examine and discuss my voting record with me on safety issues at NRC. Commissioner. Mr. Chairman, I have spent my entire professional career working on nuclear safety issues, and uh, I was elected to the National Academy of Engineering on the basis of my contributions. And, and I am going to yield the same amount of time to the ranking member as, as I am going over, so I am going to be very brief. Uh, Commissioner Ostendorf, as a former Navy officer, from your experience, not just in, within your commands, but within your military service, which is much longer than mine, don't you have countless examples you have seen of fine officers who were competent, technically capable, who were relieved because, in fact, they exhibited behavior that lost the confidence of the men and women that worked for them? Yes. Thank you. Yield to the ranking member. You know, I am sitting here and I am listening to all of this, and I swear to God, it, 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 this is incredible to me. Um, we, we're better than this, uh, and you know I feel like I'm sitting here trying to referee a fight. And I said from the beginning, I'm not a referee. I haven't done that since my kids were tiny and now they're adults. Um, Chairman Jacko, Jacko, let me tell you. I do appreciate the fact that you are willing to sit down with your colleagues. I don't want you to quit. I do not want you to quit. I want you to continue to fight for the American people and do what is right for them. And I don't think your passion and your commitment and your expertise is any greater than the other commissioners. I think all of you are very uh, wonderful, strong Americans very committed to our safety, and I believe that you've given everything, you're giving everything you've got to make things work. But we got to do better than this. Um, there is no reason, I think, why w this should have risen to this level. Um, and, Commissioner, I know people have been trying to get you to admit that you did things wrong, and I, you know, I would imagine that people in the, uh, up here would have a difficulty admitting that they were wrong when they have got opinions saying they operated within the law and what have you. I don't know what they would say, to be frank with you. But I do know one thing, that, and I, and I, and I, I mean, after 61 years on this earth, I have come to realize something that is very significant. One of the best ways not to achieve a goal is to be distracted. I mean, if you look at people who have not achieved the things that they tried to achieve in life, a lot of times it is because they got distracted. I have not come to ask you, all five of you, I have come to beg you to work this thing out. I mean, to sit down like reasonable people and work it out. The American people are tired of dysfunction. They are really tired of us. And we, what you all are doing is so very, very important. And you know, I listen to to everybody. And Commissioner Apatopoulos, I'm getting there. When you get to know him better, his name's George. <laughs> you know, I heard what you said, I, and I think you summarized it better than anybody else. When asked about whether you had lost confidence that this commissioner, the the head, uh, Mr. Jaco, could could do the job, you said, you know, you know, I I, I think he can do it. But he's got to change his attitude a little bit. Is, is that pretty much? I don't. I mean, I don't want to take words out of your mouth. What, that's pretty much what you said. Is that right? Come on, talk to me. That's a summary of what I said. No, I said. Tell me. I don't want to mis mistake you. 
he should control his temper. Yes. And let the staff send us their frank views. Stop doing what? Frank views, opinions, the staff. The okay. staff should communicate to the commissioners their candid opinions. Yeah. I mean, can you live with that, Mr. Chairman? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I, 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 you know, I keep thinking, you know, you guys got to go back. You know, all the press. You see all the press people? They're loaded up over there. They're typing away. Look at them. You know why? Because they like controversy. They want to make head. They're, they're, they're tweeting and tweeting and doing all kinds of things right now. So that, and, and then now you all have been elevated, all of you now. Everybody knows your names. But I'm telling you, when all of this is over, you got to go back. The president's not going to get rid of you. You're doing a great job. May not the attitude. You, I mean, I think you need some change some of these attitudinal things that you're dealing with. But you got to do that. And so I beg you, for, for the sake of the American people, to please sit down, work this thing out. I mean, share the information with your your fellow commissioners. Do what you got to do, but make it work. And uh, that's all I have to say. I think the recommend, ranking member. As I close the first panel, I would like to make it very clear that if this does not get resolved, this is not the last time that this committee will come to a full committee hearing to review the status of management at the NRC. Additionally, we are, we are the personnel committee of the Congress to a great extent. We do look at the management structure. We do so like a board of directors. It is not ours to tell you what to do. It is ours to find out whether it is being done as is prescribed by law and as the executive branch has said they want to do. We will retain continuing jurisdiction. We will expect all of the promises made here today of material to be added uh, to our discovery. We will, in fact, also remind everyone we are the whistleblower committee. People come to us on our lines, on the Internet, by the hundreds per week. Those people expect that if they give us information, there will be no retaliation within any agency of government. We will strictly enforce and protect anyone who comes before this committee at any time. And I know in the opening statement that was mentioned, people who come before us come protected from the moment they come to tell us something. The only time they are not protected is if they are not telling the truth, to use a double negative. We will continue to look. We will not tolerate harassment. We, we will not tolerate retribution. Now, the ranking member said it more eloquently than I could. We want you to resolve this. It is not the kind of thing that comes before Congress, and it is not particularly good other than fodder for the press. So as we continue to retain jurisdiction and oversight, bear in mind we will be looking at every action of all of you. We want you to do everything you can to live up to your oaths. And, Chairman, I would hope that as you work with Chief of Staff Daley, that you recognize that this is an extraordinary opportunity, if the President retains confidence in you, to change dramatically how these four men and women believe you are working. And I think certainly uh, at least one Commissioner has said very well that he believes that change can happen, and the others to a certain extent did, too. We are not your CEO. We are ultimately America, the American Stockholders Board of Directors, and we will assert our rights and obligations if we do not see this resolved. And that will be something that I am positive will come from both sides of the aisle. So I thank you. We'll, we are going to break briefly for a second panel. We thank you for your testimony, and we stand in recess.